Good afternoon. It is 2 p.m. on Tuesday, December 19th, and I am calling to order this special hearing. And we will begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Arenas? Not in chambers. Supervisor Chavez? Here. Supervisor Smidian? Here. Vice President Lee? Present. President Ellenberg? I am here, and I believe we need a statement from Supervisor Chavez. Correct. Thank you. Um, I'm right. Um, the state. I my here's my statement. Unfortunately, I've not been able to attend today's meeting due to a contagious illness. It's COVID, and I am therefore participating remotely using an exemption in the Brown Act called Just Cause, pursuant to Government Code. 5493F2, and I'm required to disclose if there are any individuals present um, 18 years or older in the room with me, and there are no other adults present. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez, and I hope you feel better very quickly. Thank you. Uh, to all of you who are here this afternoon, good afternoon. This is going to be a difficult meeting. I have no doubt that every person in this room would join me in saying that keeping children safe is our highest priority. There is also no doubt that our system failed Baby Phoenix and likely other children. When systems fail, it is so tempting to point fingers and isolate an individual, a department, a policy or a protocol as the culprit. I want to be clear that doing so is unproductive and hurtful. We need to take care today to keep in mind that everyone here wants to protect our children. We are here to take stock, to better understand all aspects of the complicated systems that purport to keep our children safe, and to identify opportunities for reset improvement, adjustment, and correction. As I said, the conversations today are going to be difficult, but that is okay because it is the only way to do better. So thank you for being here for today's journey. I have been reminded now by several folks that I uh, skipped the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm gonna finish my introductory comments. We will then return to the pledge um, and then to Supervisor Arenas for um, for the adjournment, uh, but since I'm here, I'm gonna keep going. I wanna posit several statements, uh, which I also believe are shared by everyone here. All children deserve to live in safe, loving, and supportive homes. The death of baby Phoenix was a horrific tragedy. I empathize with everyone here who viscerally feels the weight of grief around losing this child, and the collective weight of grief is why I ask that we offer each other the space for grace and respect as we share experiences, perspectives, and ideas for collective improvement. We are here to evolve in the mode of continuous improvement in a transparent matter, manner, and to do that, we need to ensure that everyone feels safe to speak their truth. So here is our process. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, then Turn to an adjournment from uh, Supervisor Arenas. I will then invite uh, CEO James Williams to introduce the staff presentation, which should run about 40 minutes. Next, we will hear four-minute presentations, about 17 four-minute presentations, from a number of our system and community partners and I will announce the order of presentations when we reach that part of the agenda. I think a list is in the process of being printed and will be available for distribution soon. Um, third, we will take public comment. And then finally, I will turn to my colleagues for questions, comments, discussion, and ultimately a motion regarding next steps. Colleagues, I do realize that it may be challenging for all of us not to ask questions as they arrive arise during staff and partner presentations, but I'm gonna ask you to write or jot them down and hold them until we reach item four on the agenda, which is the time set aside for the five of us. 
When we get there, I'll begin with 15-minute rounds of questions, starting with Supervisor Chavez, who is joining via Zoom, then resuming the order down the dais line from Supervisor Arenas to Simidian to Vice President Lee, and then to myself. We'll move through as many 15-minute rounds uh, as my colleagues need, but I will be firm about the breakpoints to ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity to speak. With that, uh, let me ask uh, Supervisor Arenas, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Supervisor Arenas, I will turn to you again to, to offer today's adjournment. Thank you. Baby Phoenix Castro died on May 13th of this year at the very tender age of 13 weeks. The circumstances of her death are shocking and heart-wrenching, and they're also unacceptable. And we adjourn today's meeting in a remembrance of, of her who had a whole life ahead of her. At 13 weeks, for those of us who have had children or who have children in our lives, you know that babies begin to imitate sounds, babble in baby talk, and are beginning to use their hands in a more coordinated manner. That's the stage that she reached. But she's going to continue to be remembered by those who knew her as a happy and peaceful child loved by everyone she met. She'll be remembered across our community, in particular by those who work in child welfare, who are many of us here today. And she is a child that unfortunately died on our watch. I know there are social workers in this room today who are overwhelmed with grief about the loss of this child, as well as many other workers that work under the Social Services Department or Department of Family and Children's Services and the loss of other children are also, also we also carry a heavy load for those other children who have been lost throughout the years as a result of abuse and neglect. To many of you have been alone, yelling into the wind about the dangers that our children have been facing, and I cannot imagine how helpless and lonely that must feel. Please note today we hear your cries. Personally, I finish my prayers with my kids, asking them to pray for kids all over the world who are abused. Because God will honor their prayers. I always think that children, when they pray to the one up above, whoever it is that you decide to believe in, their requests are more pure in heart. But I promise you today, we will have more than prayers to honor our children and to honor baby Phoenix. We adjourn today's meeting in her honor and the loss of all children in our community as a result of abuse and neglect. May they always be remembered. Thank you. Thank you, and may her memory be for a blessing and an inspiration and a mandate to all of us. Uh, item four is the beginning, the opening of our study session. Um, and I will turn to CEO James Williams to introduce the staff's presentation. Thank you, President Ellenberg. Before I turn things over to DFCS to present, I wanted to share a few words on behalf of myself and the county administration as a whole. As parents, as community members, and as public servants with a special responsibility to ensure our systems work as effectively as possible, we are all passionate about the well-being of children in our community keeping children safe, and helping kids and families thrive. And in particular, our social workers and leaders in DFCS and the attorneys who choose to specialize in child dependency have all made a deeply personal commitment to caring for some of the most vulnerable children in our community. They've dedicated their careers to that incredibly important cause, even though the work is often high stakes, high risk, and emotionally wrenching. As I look out across this room, I see that commitment. Thank you for all that you do. I know that while there are many perspectives and voices on many different aspects of this work, there is a shared unwavering passion 
for the well-being of children. Baby Phoenix's death is a tragedy, and whenever there's a tragedy like this, there are multiple contributing factors. Our collective challenge within the county and throughout our community is to reflect and listen and learn so we can act together to continue to strengthen our systems of care, to better protect children, and better serve families. I am committed to ongoing and continued partnerships with all of our county staff and with the many others throughout our community who share vital roles in our work to collectively protect and care for our children. I know that commitment is shared by the leadership of the Social Services Agency, our health system, each of our public safety departments, and all other leaders across the county organization. We're going to hear from several of them today, starting with our Social Services Agency, and I'll turn it over now to Dan and Damien. Thank you, James, and good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Daniel Little, Social Service Agency Director. As a social worker, my duty was always to each child and family I served. As an executive, my duty is to support our staff in serving children and families, and also to ensuring agencies and systems meet the broad needs of our community. The Department of Family and Children's Services is made up of staff from all backgrounds, all sharing a common desire to protect children, heal families, and strengthen communities. This work is complex and often traumatic and is rooted in state policy, federal law, and social worker practice. Children and families deserve the best possible support we can provide and also equity in how policy, law, and practice is applied. We know from the data this hasn't always been the case. Unfortunately, this is not an issue specific to our county, but is found in most other child welfare systems as well. In evolving our system to address a growing body of evidence, making clear that separating children from families creates long-term harm, we must also keep the immediate safety of children at the center of our work. Phoenix Castro should be alive today, and making sure we evolve our system to better protect children like her is why our discussion today is so important. DFCS staff are all deeply committed to protecting the health of children and families, and are doing the best to make very complicated difficult choices that uphold that value. I now pass this to Damien Wright, the current DFCS director. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors, as well as everybody in attendance. Mr. Wright, excuse the interruption through the chair. Could we ask for a little more volume? There's a humming noise back here that's making it a little tougher, at least from my side. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Again, forgive the interruption. Thank you. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors and everyone in attendance. Damian Wright, Director, Department of Family and Children's Services. We are here today because as a community, we are faced with losing a little baby, Baby Phoenix, to a fentanyl death. Her death has impacted us all. Even though her passing has preceded my time as director, her death has defined my early days in this position. A tragedy like this is a reminder to all of us that we need to maintain a sense of urgency about every child, every day, as we strive to improve how we work and how we support children and families. We want to make sure that there are plenty of eyes on and arms around our children. It is what defines a healthy system and a healthy community. It is a way we ensure our children thrive. Like a healthy system, the work with families continues to evolve as families are increasingly complex. We must need a constant, as there are different variables based on individual families and circumstances. And as social workers make decisions across the continuum, Nothing is more defining in our work to make sure children, again, have watchful eyes to ensure their protection and loving arms that families provide. As a department, we continue to strive towards this balance and how it is achieved. As a social worker and now as a director of DFCS, I have a unique line of sight of families and the struggles that challenge their ability to protect their children. And that struggle is even harder when fentanyl is involved. 
We have dealt with drugs and addictions before. We have seen drug epidemics destroy communities. I myself have seen the impact of drugs to a community firsthand, where a drug can dismantle a family swiftly and without regret. At, and this fentanyl is far worse and definitely more toxic. We see that all around our county, our state, and our nation. At DFCS, we are preparing ourselves to meet this challenge. We need to protect our most valuable resource, which is our children. As a director, I bring to you a specialized skill set. I've worked in multiple Southern California counties in child welfare organizations for over 20 years. I've worked for county government in child protection and for one of the largest well-known organization that leads system improvement in child welfare across the nation. I have seen what works. I have worked with and for tribes. I have partnered with faith-based institutions. And I have helped address disparity and disproportionality in the largest county in the United States. But most importantly, I helped communities bring hope, ensuring that children are safe and families are strong. The only way that I was able to do this is by partnering with staff, communities, and the families we serve. In the coming months, I plan to take every opportunity to work with each and every one of the persons in this room to strengthen our work with families and do this on behalf of our children. Here are three things that drive what I think about what our work needs to look like moving forward. Just like first responders that are here in this room today, social workers have practices and procedures that we're mandated to use. We must also rely on not only how we respond to specific situations, but also how do we make the difficult call right then and there, using what we have at that particular time. Doing the work well means to learn the balance of the two, both our processes and protocols and our clinical judgment. We also have to make efforts to drill down on and reinforce the use of our best practices, specifically around safety. This is the most critical decision we are forced to make and it is complicated. We use what is called safety organized practice multiple tools and ways to engage families. We do this to engage all of those that we come across to make sure we can support our children. That means doing three things consistently, assessments, planning, and putting in place networks, putting eyes on and arms around our children to support them in a way that they are safe. Lastly, we must keep at the front of our collective minds that we are living in challenging times and lots of families are struggling and it is our job to sort through and evaluate how those struggles are impacting safety for children. Most of what we do is difficult, but no matter how hard it is, we must keep one thing in mind children deserve a chance to live with their families. And so we must each and every time think about what that means. Removal <coughs> is often necessary, but we must also seek other options when safe to do so. We must ask the question how again, how can we get eyes needed on a child as well as make sure that they are loved and cared for in a very complex and family dynamic. I'll walk you through an overview of our system as it stands today. And I'll give it a second to get situated.
This is a complicated process that our social workers and staff must navigate through daily. We will present this process and hopefully give you a very high level understanding of our work. The multitude of decisions that we have to make as social workers and the processes that follow, including linking families to services. Our goal again is to keep children safe and families strong by partnering with communities. This will walk through when community and partners call our dedicated response. The call starts from the community, whether a family member or a neighbor or a mandated reporter calls the hotline. Within that, I want you all to remember a number, 833-SCC-KIDS. This is our direct line to our county's child abuse hotline. This is our child abuse neglect center. Our social worker staff at the CAN Center are called screeners. They answer calls 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They make sure that all of those calls are screened in to determine whether or not we need a response. If an in-person response by DFCS isn't needed, the social worker determines any support or linkages that would benefit the family, such as our differential response program, our community-based services, which our social workers are aware of. Differential response is a way for our county to provide services to families that do not need further intervention, but definitely could benefit from services. If the screening social worker assesses the call and it should be responded to in person, the screening social worker determines a social worker will make contact with the family. There is an immediate response which requires a two hour response time. This is also utilized for our joint response with law enforcement when they call for our assistance. There is also another immediate response where we respond in 24 hours from the time of the call. Lastly, there is a response time for 10 days. And what that means is we respond within 10 calendar days from the date the report is taken. This year, there has been 28,600 calls to the hotline for various reasons, including a report of child abuse and neglect and to simply get services. Approximately 10,000 of those calls were reports of abuse and neglect. 6,000 of those calls were responded to in person. The next set of slides is to talk about our investigation to intervention. When our emergency response social workers respond to investigate referrals of abuse or neglect, they need to see, talk, and observe children to make sure that they're okay. They also need to determine safety. Social workers utilize the safety assessment tool to help guide their clinical assessment. This is a balance of understanding the tool and to help decision making where there should be an individual assessment for every family. If the child or children are determined to be safe, the social worker determines if there is a need for services and resources for families. This will help prevent any harm or future harm to the child. DFCS can also help provide services to families that need assistance in the safety and care of them. If a child or children are determined to be unsafe, DFCS must immediately intervene. We must protect the child. DFCS must also work with families to see if there is safety planning that can occur to support children in their home. This is extremely difficult and complex work that involves several factors, most importantly being what is the plan that can maintain a child safely in the home. If possible, this plan outlines what safety is and how it is achieved. For a period of approximately 30 days, our social workers have opportunity to work with families. They can do a multitude of things. 
Also, this full time frame allows for an investigation and engagement of that family to help build larger support networks with the community for the family. Depending on the immediacy of the situation, DFCS must determine the level of ongoing DFCS intervention. The level of intervention ranges from supporting the family with the child in the home to children being voluntarily placed out of the home to support safety. It also includes court intervention, which is both children remaining in the home and being overseen by both DFCS and the court. And children, again, can be removed from their homes to ensure safety. When court is involved, this becomes a partnership between DFCS and the court, working towards the same goal of safety. Also, strengthening families, where children can ultimately return home or achieve permanency in another way. The current process for any court intervention is determined through social workers' clinical assessment and completion of our state mandated tool. The social worker must currently consult with supervisor and manager to make a collaborative decision around what court intervention is determined, whether it's in home or if the child needs to be removed. At the core of this decision is the parent's ability to keep the child safe, even if this is a high risk situation. However, the intervention must match the risk, and the safety plan must address any threats to the child's safety. Through the court process, our social worker continues to be vital cog in ensuring children's safety, permanency, and well-being. At the end of November 2023, DFCS had 856 cases. 430 of those cases were court-involved with the children being out of the home. 112 of those cases where children were involved in the home. 223 voluntary cases, again, children in the home. And 21 voluntary cases where children were outside of the home. As a process, DFCS consults with our partner, County Council where we determine there is court intervention required. The process includes an initial DFCS determination and decision where there will be court involvement with that family. It current, our current process directs the manager only to partner with county council on any legal parameters of the case. As the safety assessment tool is completed accurately and to fidelity, the DFCS decision is based on legal threshold at that time. County Council does provide a review and advice prior to DFCS requesting removal from the court. The court ultimately decides whether the case meets the legal and our statutory requirement for intervention. If cases are voluntary or court, it is based again on level of need risk and safety concerns identified. Social workers work to arrange reunification, adoption, or other permanent family connections for children and youth leaving foster care. There are multiple facets of work that occur in the court system, which some of the partners will speak about today. The hope is that any case leads to permanency and well-being of the child. The continued need for a case is to ensure the safety and yeah, risk. <laughs> the continued need for a case is to ensure the safety and risk to a child are mitigated or removed. As social work is built on our clinical assessments for families, we also have state mandated tools to guide our decision making. These state mandated tools are necessary to have consistent and clear processes to walk through. There are several, several structured decision making tools included but not limited to the hotline tool, safety assessment tool, and risk assessment tool. 
again, these tools guide us in our decision making. I will turn it over now to Daniel Little, SSA Director, to talk about policy and practice. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to uh, cover briefly some of the timeline um, specific items during my tenure as DFCS Director. Um, in 2020, uh, we made a change to how our wrap wraparound services um, were, were applied previously in order for a family to, to obtain that level of service. A uh, court petition was required. We modified our contracts with our providers so they were able to serve families on a voluntary basis and still access that level of care. I think a couple other important things to note. Our county was in the final cohort of three counties to implement the state's mandated structured decision making. So that began in 2016 with our hotline and finished in early 2017 for the rest of our agency. And then there was the Families First Prevention Services Act, which is a big federal act um, that was uh, in place in 2018. And then you see in 2021, our county actually implemented an in earnest FFPSA. So we started working with our providers, we started working with our partners to identify system gaps and what our county's man state required prevention plan was gonna look like. We also spent a lot of resources and a lot of time um, to do refresher trainings on structured decision making and safety organized practice. Again, we, we implemented structured decision making in 2016 and 2017. So we were still very early. So we were doing a lot of work to support to integrate SDM into our practice. The final piece I wanna talk about for 2021 um, is really around policies, practices, and law. Um, when we discuss policies, laws, and practice, I think it's important to understand why that was such a focus during this time. So I was newly appointed as the DFCS director, and one of the initial discussions I had with internal staff as well as external stakeholders was the question about why do we see such disproportionality in our child welfare system here? And again, not unique to Santa Clara County, but it is something that we have here. Almost 90% of the children in our care are children of color. So nine out of 10 kids that we were serving were children of color. So we started looking at data. Um, we started looking at the key decision points from a race equity perspective. And we saw that there were differences um, in families served by foster care versus families served for in-home voluntary. We saw that there were differences in rates of removals. We saw that there were differences in the, in the length of time children spent in foster care. All of these things really drove us to, to wanna create a system where we apply state and local policy, state and federal law, and then really good social work practice equally to all children in the county. And then later on in the presentation, Damien's gonna describe how the updates in 2023 really go to an equity standpoint. So in 2022, a lot of things were happening. Um, we began our work with a national leader around family finding, um, and it's now called family healing. This is where we first started ad addressing um, and looking at the data around the harm of, of separation. Um, this is also when we, when we first received the inquiry from the state in July of 2022, saying that they had heard some concerns about practice locally. We had our state on-site visit with our state partners in September of 2022. And Damien's gonna talk a little bit, a bit about these items later on, but we have a state-required county self-assessment, which is part of our, the state's system improvement plan. So we began a peer review um, to have our uh, other counties kind of weigh in on our plan. We also had a significant amount of stakeholder engagement in our county self-assessment. And then ongoing training for staff around warrants for removal. And then again, 2023, um, we received in February the state inquiry findings, so the, the, the findings in the report from the September visit, which identified some um, pretty specific needs around staff training and around staff, uh, around messaging to staff. Um, we had our uh, case review with the state, so nine uh, particular cases that we reviewed with them in July. And then of course we've discussed, we had the, the tragic death of baby Phoenix. At that point, an unknown cause of death, but we were working under an assumption that it was somehow related to a safe sleep. Next slide. And I think the next slides are gonna transition into a period of time where we had some leadership transition. So I had transitioned to my role in SSA director. Um, so Damien's gonna discuss some of the items specific to DFCS during this time period. I'll briefly walk through uh, a 2023 timeline that identifies several items. One being our county self-assessment. 
Our county self-assessment is a review of our practices, policies, and procedures as a department. It is in partnership with our probation department and is submitted to the state. Uh, as Daniel Little talked about, we had a peer review as well as case reviews and a partnership with our community to look at several distinct factors, including our federal measures that looks at, again, our data for a county and a department. The next piece that happened in May 2023 was our system improvement planning. Based on our county self-assessment self approval, we were able to begin our system improvement plan, identifying several pieces of strategy that we can look towards in regards to our 2022 to 2027 plan. In June 2023, we had practice refinement. And that practice refinement was based on several areas. One being not only the CDSS findings, but also review of cases, referrals, and our work at that time. Next slide. In August 2023, I was appointed as director, specifically August 21st, 2023. Several days later, in that following week, I was notified that baby Phoenix passed away due to fentanyl. Immediately upon notifying me, there was a conversation to make sure that we reviewed the case, re-reviewed what we did as a department, as well as looked at opportunities in regards to the work we were doing currently. Those reviews took place over September and October of 2023, looking at several factors, again, including similar case profile, as well as other cases that we were serving. Next slide. An initial design of a strategic framework was put together by myself as a director to make sure we responded to the state in regards to some of the work that we were doing. It outlined several pieces of how we can move forward, including an approach into looking at the right intervention for children and families, engaging families to be safe, making sure we have eyes on and around our children, and making sure we have continuous quality improvement. Based on that, and again, review of cases, referrals, and other information, as well as in November, another baby passed away that we had no knowledge of prior to this. Her name was Winter Rio. Based on that information and understanding the impacts of fentanyl, and what it can do in combination with other drugs, there was interim direction set focused on several areas, and I'll work through them now. The interim direction that I've set focused on, again, three significant pieces, including looking at safety and risk assessments, substance abuse exposed newborns, and our legal consultation process. The safety protocols reminded staff of the process required within structured decision making, including the completion of all areas in our tools. Also, there was a reminder that everything should be documented in our case management system and state required. It is also required to document any risk and safety assessment. That system is called our Child Welfare Services Case Management System. Lastly, as our most vulnerable children are in need for higher level of intervention while still keeping families home, whole and together, there can be a partnership with the court in providing higher risk cases with support and monitoring to create a pathway to success. This is called court family maintenance. The interim direction also focused on the importance of understanding the growing negative impact fentanyl has on families and the continued impact amphetamines and methamphetamines have on our community, 
as these drugs are more potent, especially when mixed together. It is important to be more vigilant when supporting families as best we can, as early as we can, starting at our hotline. We also need to have clear monitoring in combination with other resources. As the concern posed by staff continued regarding DFCS partnership with our Partners County Council, there needed to be clarity on decision making. Decision making regarding child welfare is made by the Department of Family and Children's Services. This process had to be separated where DFCS clearly made the decision prior to any legal consultation. This decision is based on social workers' clinical assessment and the state mandated tool. Our legal consultation is not a decision making meeting, but it is to help support DFCS around legal parameters of decision making. As the SDM tool is based in Welfare and Institutions Code, the element of that tool, if completed to fidelity, decision making should be in alignment with the dependency legal threshold. In regards to system improvement, as DFCS is focused on system improvement, we will continue to utilize the state required California Child and Family Services review process. This will support lessons learned and also be an accountability structure around data, practice, policies, and procedures. This will help us achieve safety, permanency, and well being for all our children. DFCS will utilize the annual system improvement plan process to adjust its work as needed. DFCS has incorporated many of the elements presented here today in its submitted system improvement plan. As information was garnered through its county peer review, stakeholder and staff feedback, and case reviews, we will continue to incorporate continuous learning in our system improvement plan as well as receive any board direction in doing so. As the new director, there needed to be interim direction set based on the needs of the department at that time and the ever-changing child welfare landscape. There needed to be a vision moving forward, addressing current issues, current concerns, and setting a pathway. This included an approach that helped tangibly get to best practices for safety and centering on the priority areas identified. This approach lands on things we value in child welfare, both locally and across the nation. Again, we must determine the right intervention, engage families to support race equity. Again, put our arms on around and eyes on children and continually get better. This approach drives us towards safeguarding children, supporting our staff, and building key partnerships, including working with multiple partners to re-envision, re I'm sorry, DFCS from a child welfare department to becoming a child and family well-being system. It also includes working with our staff and unions to support them in the work they do. Working with our medical community around plans of safe care for safe discharges of substance exposed newborns, building teaming meetings with medical partners to share information around the child's safety and ensure the right medical attention is sought. Working with partners like our sheriff's department and local departments like San Jose PD to respond to crises and serve families in the moment. Working with our county office of education and local school districts to ensure there are partnerships around reporting and supporting families. Working with our community providers to provide best services to families in their homes and while children are in and with their families. Working with communities also to address disparity and disproportionality 
for black children, Latino children, and native children in our system. Working with our court and legal partners to get to safety, permanency, and well-being for all our children that enter those doors. And lastly, working with our families to make them whole. As we set a pathway forward, there are several areas of focus that drive our work, including focusing on our most vulnerable children, including our older complex need youth. I've discussed plans of safe care. There also needs to be work around race equity to make sure, again, we address disparity and disproportionality. I've talked about key partnerships and the role they play in our work. In closing, the fentanyl crisis looms and its dangers are almost insurmountable. Families are being damaged and yet we can work together to address it. I commend Supervisor Chavez for establishing work in our county to partner around this and move forward with the fentanyl work group. As we continue to get better at getting better, we look to families we support to partner with us. We look to the community to partner with us. And we also look to staff to do the incredible work they are able to do. Children deserve their family. We must determine when possible and when safe, how can we do that? If we can't in the moment, then when can we? And if it is unsafe, we must quickly intervene. And we have to remember, if we remove children, it is temporary. Children don't fare well in a foster care system. It is complex, difficult, and heart-wrenching work. Our social workers do this every day. In all this, I have hope. Hope we can come together as a community Hope we team to fight this new monster of fentanyl. Hopefully we can treat families equitably. We can do better together. Also, I ask that these circumstances shouldn't be the reason we all meet as one. Today, it should be the ringing of a bell and we must respond. We keep children safe. We make families strong. We have to do this through partnership. Thank you. I wasn't done, but go ahead. One more statement, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, uh, and it's actually a personal statement, but I will say it. Uh, as my granddaughter is the newest member of my family and just turned one, it is a reminder that family is something that all kids need and deserve. It is also a reminder of what she needs and what my family and my community needs to do to make her safe and what that looks like. This Saturday, we all had our eyes on her as, we, as she walked around and we all made sure our arms were wrapped around her with love. There is nothing more important than child safety for all of our children in Santa Clara County. There is no way to achieve safety, permanency, and well-being for children without their families and without their communities. Thank you. Thank you, Damien, and thank you, uh, Nick, both for um, sharing process information uh, with us. We're gonna round out the uh, store of information with our next presenters, and I believe the list, are we posting the order of speakers? Excellent. Thank you, and um, thank you so much. And, 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 and the list was developed in, in partnership with uh, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Arenas, and is meant to represent not an entirely uh, exhaustive and complete list of everyone who works in the county in support of children, but hopefully a broad enough array to give us a good sense of the multiple perspectives and multiple roles. Each speaker um, is invited, if you're already at the dais, you're welcome to 
speak from there. If you'd like to come up to the podium, uh, come up to the podium. Uh, four minutes, and we will be um, tight on, on the timing. So look forward to learning from all of you. And I will begin with our probation chief, Nick Burchard. And the timer will begin when you begin your presentation. Good afternoon, uh, Board of Supervisors. My name is Nick Burchard, Chief Probation Officer. Uh, what I would like to um, say and comment are just a few words um, with probation's relationship with TFCS um, and, and currently what's going well today. Um, as you all know, our duly involved unit um, an intense, uh, is an initiative often recognized for the collaborative work uh, between our DIY unit, our probation officers, our social workers, and our behavioral health staff. Um, I, I would like to point out that there's a collaboration, a collaborative effort that spills out from this unit um, into the rest of our units as well. So any, any probation officer that works in this unit and then eventually transfers to other supervision units, they take that experience with them and they take that relationship and the understanding of how to work with kids in a very different way um, that we learn together with um, our work with DFCS. So I'd like to highlight that. Um, secondly, DFCS has become a resource for our JPD, Juvenile Probation Department probation officers uh, when a person on their caseload is struggling with the care of their probation involved child. Recently, we've had a number of parents refuse to come and pick up their child um, if they come into juvenile hall. Um, with our relationship with DFCS, we contact them. They reach out and contact the parent and build on that relationship for them to come pick their child up. Um, they then stay with that child and work with our probation officers to provide services to those families when we need them. Um, thirdly, DFCS always comes to the table even we're in disagreement with how to proceed with challenging cases. We definitely have some very challenging cases that both of us serve in our systems um, and sometimes trying to figure out the right path forward for these youth and their families. Um, even though sometimes we don't agree, um, we do come to the table and we have those difficult conversations and put the child first and what's best for the child and the family. And I think that that's important to highlight here. An area that I see as an opportunity for both of us um, and certainly for everybody in this room and everyone knows that the expanding of the continuum care placement options available to youth. This is especially for those youth with high mental health needs. Um, there are no local short-term residential care facilities for our kids with high-end needs. Um, this has created a very, very difficult situation for our kids in this community. Uh, when you couple that um, with the substance use issues that we're speaking about today with fentanyl, it just heightens the awareness and heightens the emergencies that we need to get kids in placements um, that we often fight and struggle with with other placements in counties and jurisdictions across the state. There just is not enough beds and places um, in the continuum care facilities for our kids. And I'll take any questions if you have. We're going to hold questions until the end of the present presentations, but thank you very much, uh, Chief Burchard. Uh, we're next going to hear from Dr. Sherry Terrell, who's the Director of our Behavioral Health Services. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Our department, our Behavioral Health Services Department, is responsible for providing mental health and substance use treatment services to children, youth, young adults, adults, and older adults that are Medi-Cal beneficiaries or are uninsured in our county. As most of you know, county government is a level of government charged with the provision of most public health and human services and the correlation between children and families with unmet needs and utilization of the county's justice, child welfare, drug and alcohol treatment, mental health, and other systems is well documented. Behavioral Health has had a long-standing relationship and partnership with the Department of Family and Children's Services, with the Behavioral Health Services Department being responsible for providing treatment services. As many of you have read in the supporting documents for today's hearing, 
The core values of the child welfare system are to promote the well-being of children by ensuring safety, achieving permanency, and strengthening families. And the behavioral health services system and its system of care is intended to support this purpose by providing behavioral health services for those with a mental health or substance use diagnosis. Over the past several decades, the Behavioral Health Services Department has partnered on statewide initiatives for which there is crossover with child welfare. Most notably in 2013, about 10 years ago, the county was responsible for implementing programming that stemmed from a 2002 class action lawsuit in a neighboring county with um, expansion and responsibility to all 58 counties across the, st across the state which was essentially to implement and obtain wraparound and therapeutic foster care services for children in or at risk of placement in foster care or group homes. In December 2011, the final, final settlement was approved. Uh, many of you will understand and refer to this system change as KDA, which was a reference to a minor child who was 14 years old at the time the lawsuit was filed, had been placed in foster care for 10 years, and had moved through 37 placements during her time in foster care. Early assessment had indicated services were needed, but she did not receive trauma treatment or individualized mental health services. As a result, a core practice model guide and Medi-Cal manual were developed as part of the settlement agreement. This process involved ensuring that children coming into the child welfare system were screened for mental health and trauma, and that a team-based approach to providing care through a trauma-informed approach with the inclusion of a child and family team were core components. Since that time, Behavioral Health has continued to partner with the Department of Family and Children's Services, even co-locating behavioral health staff within the Department of Family and Children's Services to further help strengthen opportunities to consult and discuss the needs of children, youth, and families um, that also have behavioral health and or substance use needs. There's clear recognition from the presentation that you heard earlier of how complex and dynamic the needs of children and families are in our community. We know there is risk and vulnerability of children due to substance abuse, and the Board of Supervisors, along with county administration and the Behavioral Health Services Department, are placing a significant and huge focus on growing our behavioral health services, more specifically our substance use treatment services to meet these demands. We also recognize how profoundly traumatic removal of children from their families is. And we continue to work to strengthen our approaches to keep children safe while recognizing that separation of children from families is also traumatic and will contribute sometimes to future attachment issues as children grow and develop. As we've stated here today, we must all work together as a community to help support the well-being of Thank children. Thank you, Dr. Trow. Dr. Sarah Redman of Public Health. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Redman, thank you, Madam uh, President. Um, the public health, I represent the Public Health Department as both the Deputy Health Officer and currently serving as Department Director. And ultimately, as we've talked today about how supporting a family to safely keep a child at home usually creates the best outcome for that child. The Public Health Department has multiple programs that are designed to support families in such settings. One type of program we offer is designed to uh, provide wraparound services for somebody in order to have a healthy pregnancy and raise a healthy child. This can happen through review of the medical chart to ensure recommended screenings and services are provided or through nurse visits to the home to offer basic screening exams, lactation support, child safety education, or referral to preventive services like vaccination and oral health. These programs include the Nurse Family Partnership, Strong Moms, Strong Babies, and the Black Infant Health Program. And these programs are each specifically designed for certain populations, such as African and African ancestry women, or first-time parents, or those with low income, such as CalWORKs recipients. Secondly, Public Health operates two programs with very specific services for vulnerable children and their families. The Women, Infants, and Children Program, WIC, which supports nutritional uh, information and access to healthy foods for low-income families as well as the California Children's Services Program, which supplies physical and occupational therapy, case management, and financial support. And then finally, we operate two programs specifically for children in the dependency system. The healthcare program for children of foster care offers nurse case management to coordinate the complexities of health and social care for children who've been placed in foster settings. 
and the FIRST-5 program provides nurse home visitation to youth involved in dependency system, prioritizing those who've been placed in foster settings. And it's through this final category of programs where we coordinate most closely with DFCS to ensure the safety of children and success of families in the dependency system. These programs are all operated by public health nurses who are mandated reporters, which means they're legally required and trained to identify signs of abuse or neglect and to report these to DFCS. And while these are very different programs and many of them, they each have specific limited scopes for who qualifies and resource to serve a fraction of the total families who may benefit from this kind of support. And even prior to the tragic cases we've discussed today, public health has been looking for new ways to partner with our colleagues in DFCS and has been meeting regularly with Mr. Wright and his team over the last few months to look for additional ways to enhance communication, referrals, and coordination to maximize these resources. So on behalf of the department, we appreciate this forum to discuss options for improving these systems and thinking critically where further changes could benefit the health and safety of our children in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Redman. Uh, Judge Shauna Schwartz. If the next couple of folks want to come down and grab chairs as well, you're very welcome to do so. Good afternoon, Judge. Oh, microphone. Microphone isn't on. Hi, my name is Shauna Schwarz, and I am the supervising judge of juvenile dependency court here in our county. Um, I do have to, to uh, state a caveat before I begin, and that is that my comments have to be necessarily measured. I was in court this morning removing kids, and I will be in court tomorrow doing the same thing. So I do have to um, display a bit of balance here. Sure. I've been on the bench for 22 years, and almost 20 of that has been in dependency court, and that is by choice. I tell you that for two reasons. First of all, over 20 years, I have seen tremendous changes in our system. And secondly, uh, having been on the bench so long, I interface uh, quite a bit with judicial colleagues across the state who are in dependency court. And I know from speaking with them that our department, our Department of Family and Children's Services, is probably one of the best in the state. Uh, by and large, it is staffed with social workers who are passionate, dedicated, hardworking, and who truly want to do what is best for children and families. That being said, I think something went awry um, over the last few years. Um, I track a lot of numbers and metrics uh, as a part of my role. For example, when I started in 2000, we had, uh, in, 2000, in about 2000, we had about 3,000 children who were subject to the court's jurisdiction. Today, we have about 420. So we've seen a significant decrease, and that's because as a system we've improved, because social work has become more refined and has uh, made changes and improvements over the years. The other metric that I track very closely is the number of new petitions we get each year. One petition equals one child, and that, those are kids that are brought to the court's attention. And I started tracking those numbers because I, I couldn't really trust, um, well, or maybe I should say the court didn't trust me to run reports from the court system, and so I thought I would just keep my own numbers. Um, in looking at 2018, 2019, we had an average of about 600 petitions filed, so 600 new children coming to court. In 2021, a mere two, three years later, that number was 196 so about a, a third of the number, and in 2022, 106 children, 18% of what we saw previously in the last three to four years. I wanna know, are those 400 children who would have been filed on four years ago, are they safe, and how do we know they're safe? And I understand and appreciate that they are being uh, provided with informal services, but again, the question is, are those children safe? And I only know about the kids that come to court. I only know about the petitions that are filed, but I think I can certainly um, interpolate or maybe it's extrapolate to those kids that were not filed on because they're similar to the children who would have been filed on um, previously. I will also just mention that my colleagues in family court and probate court have felt the strain 
of the changing policies that the department has had in terms of not filing petitions. Um, the experience, and I, I pulled them before I came today to ask about their experiences. They don't have numbers, but they certainly have anecdotal information that they are seeing cases in family and probate, probate specifically for guardianships, that um, where they're told the social worker said file a guardianship or cases that need um, much, much more extensive services than are available in the family and the probate courts. So I do look forward to the outcome of today and I think we are uh, starting to, to get back in the right direction based on some of the changes that Mr. Wright has made. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge. Uh, our next presenter. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Our next presenter is Katie Jo from the Dependency Advocacy Center, and she's joining us on Zoom. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Jo, and I am the incoming CEO of the Dependency Advocacy Center, or DAC. Our agency represents parents in dependency court, and we are also the conflicts agency for minor representation with approximately 20% of our court clients being children. Our attorneys work closely with in-house social workers, as well as mentor parents with lived experience who support and guide our clients. In addition to our court work, we have two interdisciplinary programs that support parents before a case has been filed in court, um, Corridor and First Call for Families. The legal scheme set up around dependency is complex, and I do urge this board to take the time to learn more about it in depth. Broadly speaking, however, the goal of the law is to balance two constitutional interests, the right of parents to care for their children and the right of children to live in a safe home. Please note that I do not say balance against because these two goals are fundamentally interrelated. Children, of course, do want to live in safe homes, but they also deeply long for the relational wholeness that only their families can offer. Our goal at DAC is to work towards this dual vision of safety and relational wholeness. With that being said, what we have seen is that the court system is entirely inadequate, excuse me, not entirely inadequate, but is often inadequate to help children stay safe and meet their need for relational wellness. Although I do believe that everyone has the best intentions, far too many people, both across the country and in our community, are still living with the scars from an approach that assumed that taking children away from their families was automatically the same thing as keeping them safe. I wanna be clear that there are in fact extreme situations where removal is the tool required to ensure safety, but I believe it is both harmful and a waste of public resources to view removal as a primary means of ensuring safety. Our work in prevention has shown us that families in crisis have the ability to keep their children safe when given the right support and resources and faith. In fact, many of our clients had children removed by the court system and were unable to reunify, but when offered support based in community with the bonds with their children intact, we have seen entire families succeed and thrive in a completely different way. I think right now, rather than asking when children should be removed, we need to ask how will we as a community take collective responsibility for the underlying challenges that create the need for removal in the first place. This, this approach will require collective solutions and not simply the attention of a single county agency. But the good news is that there are proven solutions available to us, including investing more resources in treatment, support, and solutions for problems like substance abuse, domestic violence, and mental illness. Above all, we need more tangible resources for families living in poverty. I do echo the calls of the other panelists here who are noting the urgency of the public health crisis that is fentanyl and the need for more public education, more research, and more resources devoted to treatment and safety options. I would also urge the department not to respond to this crisis by overreaching and whisking all children and families into court for issues that could be addressed based in community. We will need a stronger response to the problem of fentanyl, but I believe that we can and should distinguish that response from others in which families need our help and not our censure. Most of all, my, I urge that we do not jump immediately into a plan of action based purely on emotions. I'm deeply concerned to hear people in this community automatically equate child safety with the removal of children from their families. I ask that this board and this community um, put more faith in families' capacity to care for their own children and devote the time and the energy needed uh, to have thoughtful, careful conversations. Above all, I would ask 
that moving forward, our public conversations elevate not only people on this panel, but Thank the voice of Thank you very much. Parents. I appreciate your time. Our next speaker is Amanda Kennedy uh, from Legal Advocates for Children and Youth. Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Kennedy, and I am the supervising attorney of the Juvenile Dependency Team at Legal Advocates for Children and Youth, or LACI. LACI's had the contract to represent youth in the court-involved dependency system since 2009, and by law, our role as attorneys for children in this system requires that we assess cases independently from the Child Welfare Agency and advocate for our clients' best interests. In order to do so, we use an interdisciplinary model in which attorneys work alongside our team of master's level social workers. And although dependency attorneys are only appointed when a petition is filed, Lacey works with youth in many other areas that intersect with the child welfare system, such as family court, probate guardianships, education, and immigration. At the outset, I think it's important to state that we agree philosophically with DFCS that as a system, we must strive to avoid removing children from their families. It is not good or healthy to entrench families in the child welfare system. However, child safety needs to come first. And it's not clear to us that that is always happening. We have observed that of the cases that have entered the court-involved system in recent years, Many families had come to the attention of the department on multiple occasions before formal intervention was finally utilized. Relatedly, over approximately the past two years until relatively recently, DFCS opted to file very few out-of-custody petitions. We think that this approach resulted in at least some cases that should have had court oversight remaining in an informal posture. From a youth's perspective, it's important to note that when cases aren't filed, parents may still have access to support and legal counsel because they're adults, and they can seek out resources and choose to engage when they are referred to services. And that's great, we want that for families. But children on their own don't have that agency. And we welcome any opportunities to work with the department to explore ways to address this difference in resources. When cases do come before the court, it has appeared to our team that line social workers do not always have the ability to make recommendations based on their own independent clinical assessments. And outside of dependency, as minors counsel in probate and family court, we've seen a marked increase, as indicated by Judge Schwarz, in cases in those court systems. And we believe that increase is tied to the department's changes in practice. While sometimes those courts are a better fit, they do not have the resources and services available to children and families that the dependency system can provide. We were asked to make some recommendations to DFCS as we look ahead, and our first and most important recommendation is that DFCS recommit to centering child and young person's safety and well-being. That includes empowering social workers to utilize their clinical expertise to make recommendations that are in line with their individual assessments of child safety, which leads to our next recommendation, which is increased transparency around safety assessment. We believe that it's important to develop and maintain a narrow set of procedures to guide deviation from the SDM. It should follow a protocol, be documented, and in court-involved cases, any deviation should have an analysis, and that analysis and documentation should be shared proactively rather than only through the legal discovery process. And finally, we are here because of a tragedy involving a very young child and a horrific drug. But we would caution against exclusive focus on children ages zero to five and fentanyl. We'd be doing young people, their families, and our community a disservice if we did not also apply the lens of our concerns to children of all ages facing any type of risk to their health and safety. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> we'll next hear from uh, Santa Clara County Council's office, uh, represented by County Council Tony Lopresti. Thank you, President Ellenberg. I'm gonna turn it over to Assistant County Counsel Michaela Lewis to briefly discuss the role of County Counsel in providing legal advice to DFCS, but first just wanted to offer a couple of thoughts. First, like so many people here, our attorneys that do this work have devoted their lives to serving and protecting children. 
Baby Phoenix's death has profoundly impacted them. And they have, and I share, a deep commitment to continuous learning so that we're doing everything possible to protect children, support families, and prevent tragedies like this from happening again. Second, I recognize there's been a lot of concern over County Council's role in DFCS's processes. I want to be very clear about what the role of County Council is and is not. Our job is to provide legal advice. It's not to supplant social workers' clinical judgment. And while that may have been clear in protocol, if it hasn't been clear in practice, if it hasn't been clear in the day-to-day, -day, then we have a responsibility as attorneys in coordination with the department to make it clear at every turn. We're committed to achieving that culture of clarity while also providing excellent legal advice to help inform DFCS's decision making. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Lewis. Thank you, Tony. Um, to step back, I would like to provide an overview of the legal services our office provides. Michaela, apologies. Oh. Can you stay closer to your mic, please? Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Um, to provide an overview of the legal services our office provides to DFCS. Just like any other county department, our office reviews contracts, advises on public records requests, privacy requirements, security requirements, labor and employment matters. For DFCS, we also have a dedicated team of attorneys that represent the department before the juvenile dependency court. This team is co-located with DFCS at Social Services Agency's Julian Street Campus and specializes in dependency law. They provide advice to DFCS on whether the legal standards for court intervention for a specific child have been met. While the advice of a particular attorney may not reflect their personal opinions, they have an ethical duty to speak to what the law requires as set forth by the legislature and interpreted by the courts through case law. The relevant legal standards are based on statutes. And while the plain language of the statutes in some instances appears straightforward, court interpretations of the language adds to the complexity and nuances. And that law is always evolving. Just last week, the California Supreme Court issued an opinion on the legal standard a child welfare department must prove to a juvenile dependency court for the court to take jurisdiction of a child because of their parent's substance abuse. And it's this team's job to make sure the department is aware of these types of case law developments. It's important to note that this is just one example to illustrate the complexity. There is, in fact, a robust case law history of child welfare that informs each of the legal standards. This team is dedicated to providing the best legal advice possible to the department. And I also want to emphasize the point that Tony made. Our commitment is to ensuring that there is clarity of our role. Our role is not to make clinical decisions, but rather to provide legal advice to the department as it makes those decisions, and to reinforce that clarity in each interaction we have with the department. Thank you. Thank you both. Lorena uh, Briones is going to speak on behalf of the social workers at SEIU 521, El Comité. You're welcome to come up together. In fact, I have Carla from SEMA speaking between you, but if the two SEIU we're folks gonna, want to go back to back, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm going to start, and Lorena, then Pa. If you got okay. it. Thank you for organizing this hearing today. My name is Carla Torres, and I'm here representing the El Comité Employee Group and SEMA, the County Employees Management Association. I've worked for the department for 23 years. El Comité is a part of a larger coalition of employee groups, which represents our diverse workforce and community. Regardless of our classification and identities in the department, we're in this together. And we need to look at systemic changes that impact our most vulnerable, and specifically our families of color. The most impacted in our department have been and continue to be families who are Native Indigenous, African Ancestry Black, and Chicano, Latino, Latinx. As our coworker Justo Valenzuela reminds us, children are sacred, and that should drive our work. Today, we would like to offer concrete short-term goals to help move us forward in the interest of serving our families. We can't emphasize enough the importance of both family voice as well as the ability for staff to do this job daily and those with experience to be at the table when making changes, decisions, or looking at ways to improve the system. 
The unions, SEMA and SEIU 521 are unified on and in support of the following recommendations as a starting point. One, unfreeze social worker or unfreeze all positions needed for infrastructure in DFCS. Two, focus on gaps in services and the need to partner with existing agencies that are providing regional, linguistic, culturally specific services for families. And three, social workers and supervisors need to be included in decision-making meetings on cases, especially and in including when there's consultation with legal counsel. El Comité, which usually represents our Spanish-speaking community, also is advocating for all families, and we recommend the following in collaboration with La Raza Roundtable. Services needed, need to be tailored to the families needs in terms of the region they live in, which includes consideration of those that live in South County. Services from the department need to be in the native language of the family with bilingual, bicultural consideration and assignment of social worker. Any and all forms from the department must be translated in the language or format that the family can understand, which includes consideration of sign language and our current threshold languages of Vietnamese and Spanish. The majority of our parents that come to our attention have experienced trauma, violence, and suffer from mental illness and the disease of addiction. And some, in our, some were children in our system and products of our system. The following were statements gathered from parents who have been in our system and successfully reunified. Some of our families return to the department multiple times and are unable to receive services once their court timelines are exhausted. We need funding for these situations. Services provided should not be the same for all and we should move away from cookie cutter case plans. They need tailored specific needs. Santa Clara County needs a residential treatment facility for our youth. Please look into providing funding for this and study the satellite homes, positive or negative. Is it working? Because our youth in care are in crisis. They're using and abusing substances and unfortunately some are ODing. We should have concern for their well-being and life in the current fentanyl crisis. They are also sacred. Otherwise, our youth are being institutionalized. And I would like to remind us all of the definition of equity. Equity is a process of eliminating racial disparities and improving outcomes for everyone. That's what we need to do here in Santa Clara County for all families. This is a long-term goal, but we can start with the above mentioned recommendations. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, who's going next, Lorena or Pat? Yeah. Good afternoon, my name is Lorena Briones. I am one of the chief stewards for SCIU, the worker chapter, an emergency response social worker and member of the Mesa Directiva del Comité. I have devoted my career to social services agency, working as a frontline worker in multiple programs without, within the Department of Family and Children's Services and the Department of Aging and Adult Services. The following are some recommendations to help us move forward during this tragic time after the losses for the Castro family. We have to to do better as an agency and make the necessary systemic and infrastructure changes needed to support the families and communities we are serving. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of keeping social workers and supervisors involved in the decision-making process when consulting with county council on high-risk families and possible removals. We use to staff these high-risk referrals with the investigating social workers, the supervisors, managers, and county council so there could be a solid plan and we were all part of the decision process. This was removed from us. The social worker staff is trained to complete the family psychosocial assessment and trained in safety organized practice and the structured decision making tools which could save a child's life. When we shifted to the prevention intervention model in 2021, there was not sufficient community resources and proper oversight. That did not help when it was coupled with the fentanyl crisis. This is a public health crisis and we need to partner up with public health nurses when we are investigating referrals with severe substance use such as fentanyl and methamphetamines. This crisis cannot be tasked to the social workers only. It will take public health nurses, medical social workers, community partners, and more social workers to 
social workers to conduct home visits throughout Santa Clara County. There is a need for more staff in prevention front end services, which are the areas of the hotline, emergency response, dependency investigation, non-core VFM, IS, non-minor dependent, and the satellite homes. As an ER worker, I can tell you firsthand the gaps that I have seen in connecting families to community services in an effort to prevent them from being brought into the system. I have referred multiple families in the past to our community-based programs, and at times the families are waitlisted, and some of these programs do not have the funds and language capacity to serve our families. We recommend that when agreeing to contracts with community, ag community agencies, that they are equipped and prepared to, prepared to serve the families immediately at the emergency response level. Otherwise, families will be lost through the cracks without any attention and care. We need to have readily available substance abuse treatment services in the minimum threshold languages of Vietnamese and Spanish. The data has shown and continues to show that the department has and continues to show um, that has a disproportionate number of children and families of color in our system as compared to the general population, more specifically impacting families who are Native, Indigenous, African ancestry, Black, Mexican, Chicano, Latino, and Latinx populations. During the shift in practice, even when the decreasing number of children and families were brought into the system, the disproportionality did not change, which tells us that the decision to not bring families into the system has little to no effect on disproportionality. We need to do more for our families. There are several areas of improvement at the point of the initial call to our hotline to emergency response to assure that these cases are linguistically and culturally assigned appropriately through the life of the case as we are working with the whole family. We need to ensure we have the infrastructure with frontline staff at all client facing points of contact. We need to support our workforce with the proper tools from training and experienced supervisors and managers in the decision-making process. There needs to be a middle ground. Thank we you so much, Lorena. team to be proactive, <laughs> not... Pa, go ahead, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You turn your mic on, please. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Pa Chang, and I'm a supervisor at DFCS and representing SEIU 521 for the Supervisor and Social Services Analyst Chapter. I have been a county employee for over 20 years. My entire career is child welfare for 20 plus years. Since early 2021, we have had a practice change in which we were prevented from intervening at the court level when children are in danger. Because of the heavy emphasis of prevention without a voice in legal consultation and the lack of resources, we saw the increase of harm to the most vulnerable. Since November of this year, due to another shift in practice as a response to scale back prevention, we have now tripled the number of court interventions. Yet we do not have the infrastructure to handle the change. We still do not have the ability to consult at the legal level. Often we rely on third and fourth hand directives passed down. In 2021, DFCS has six units of court investigators comprised of six supervisors and about 42 social workers. Three units were then removed. Now there are only two supervisors and 10 social workers left because of the retention and the morale. The third unit is vacant. We need to ensure that the workforce is prepared and not shift staff from one area to another in a state of crisis. We do not have court investigator workers to manage the amount of cases coming in at this time. In addition, social workers and supervisors do not have the ability to conduct background checks on individuals when assessing risk or protective capacity as we used to before. This barrier has been in place for five to six years with no resolution. We have not been able to build and help create safety because we only see one area of concern but are unable to assess the entirety of the situation. This is a flaw in the system that actually creates risk and liability. We also have staff who are moved into areas that they are not trained in and are not equipped with the necessary tools needed to do the job well. Because of our growing community, we need agency process and support that is relevant to the current work. We have seen an increase in behavioral health and mental health needs, significant increase in substance abuse use of fentanyl, 
illicit drugs laced with fentanyl. And although we are concerned for our community at large, we also cannot forget our current children who are in foster care. With the shift of our practice as of November, we are seeing an increase in children entering our foster homes and satellite homes, which lack the necessary support and resource to help our children who are traumatized. These are examples of practice shift that have occurred, but the process and infrastructure is not set up to meet the demands. In other areas, our child abuse hotline is struggling to answer every call, and often the calls are taken as messages from clerical staff. We need our hotline center to have the technological support and staffing that can help respond to the urgency of families and children. Our system in the way that we are operating and managing currently is outdated. In investing in our infrastructure to align our program is key, but it cannot be done at one level only. It requires listening to the voices of those who do the work day in and day out, collaborate with those who have years of experience in child welfare, and the recognition that the workforce is valuable in carrying the mission of the agency and the county. These are complex issues, but as a social worker who have dedicated my career to child welfare, a Title IV-E recipient, as well as many of my peers here and my colleagues who have dedicated their careers to child welfare. I believe that solutions are possible if we are committed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker, our next three, if they want to come down, are uh, Dr. Marlene Strum, uh, District Attorney Jeff Rosen, and James Gibbons Shapiro from the Child Abuse uh, Prevention Council. And just want to note to any of you who aren't familiar, if you're seeing supervisors go back and forth, perhaps to dash to the restroom or get some water, there are speakers back there. We continue to hear you. I don't want anyone to think that we are leaving the room and leaving the hearing. Uh, Dr. Strum, let's begin with you. Good afternoon. The Children's Advocacy Center of Santa Clara County provides medical care for children from infancy to 17 years who have survived all forms of child abuse, including physical abuse and neglect, sexual abuse and assault, trafficking and abduction. We provide comprehensive trauma-informed medical care, arrange for appropriate follow-up care, and provide behavioral health assessments at the CAC. The National Children's Alliance informed us recently that our CAC ranks among the top handful of CACs in the United States. I have been asked to discuss today the group of survivors who are not receiving medical care through the CAC, the acute adolescent safe patients. These children, 12 to 17 years old, who survived sexual assault within 10 days, are currently seen by the adult SART team on the VMC campus. Since we opened doors, we have asked the adult SART team to see the children at the CAC. The adult SART team has a dedicated exam room at the CAC clinic that sits empty every day. The adult SART team has seen four children at CAC since we opened two and a half years ago. Instead, these children are screened at the VMCED with wait times of three, five, seven hours or longer, and then they begin a safe exam at the ED or elsewhere at VMC. By contrast, patients seen at CAC typically receive medical care within one hour of arrival. Here is what child survivors of sexual assault can expect. If a child 12 years or older experienced sexual assault 11 days ago or more, they receive medical care at the CAC. To be clear, our medical team already sees more than half the adolescent survivors of sexual abuse in the county and all the younger child survivors. If the child is 12 years old or older, and experienced sexual assault nine days ago, they received care by the adult SART team with clearance at the VMCED and without the resources that we offer at CAC. If this is confusing to you, it's confusing to law enforcement. The Santa Clara County Child Abuse Protocol instructs law enforcement to interview all survivors at the CAC, but they cannot bring this group of teenagers to us for medical care. In the last two weeks, we received phone calls about two children 12 and 14 years old. In each case, police expressed frustration that our team could not provide medical care at the CAC. And in each case, the adult SART team declined to come to the CAC. Sometimes it's even harder. Sometimes a survivor has a forensic interview at the CAC, and then we have to tell the family to leave the CAC and go to the VMCED. 
we have had patients leave in tears and patients refuse to go. So why are these children receiving care from the adult safe team? The first answer is historical. The adult team has cared for these teenagers for many years. Our response is, now we have the CAC with all the resources available. We embrace change and we embrace best practice and we support equity for all our patients. We also hear that survivors require emergency department screening for more severe injuries, including strangulation. The child abuse literature and our experience at VMC do not support this position. Our senior pediatric radiologist told me last Friday, it's a meme in our department. The neck CTs are always negative. Even the adult neck CTs are negative. In our view, all children who survive abuse should be assessed by a medical provider with expertise in child abuse and admitted to the hospital if appropriate. This is what our colleagues do at other institutions, including UCSF Zuckerberg and Chadwick in San Diego. To be clear, this is the only group of pediatric patients at VMC who receive care without the ongoing collaboration of child abuse pediatrics and inpatient pediatrics. The leadership and members of the adult SAR team are adult safe nurses without special training in Thank child abuse. Thank you very abuse. much, Dr. Strom. Thank you. I appreciate your presentation. Uh, District Attorney Rosen. Thank you. As your DA, I'm here for the children. We're all here for the children. They may not be ours, but they are our responsibility. I believe that all of us are here to do everything in our power to make things better for them because they need that. My office is deeply involved in issues about the safety of children. We prosecute and hold accountable people who hurt children. We facilitate the work of the Children's Advocacy Center to provide them coordinated and compassionate services from the DA's office, law enforcement, medical teams, nonprofit partners, and DFCS. We provide long-term victim services to children who have been abused or neglected, and we are prosecuting the deaths of baby Phoenix and baby Winter. Because of that work, I and my team have seen firsthand how there needs to be a rethinking and rebalancing of the efforts to protect children. There is racial disproportionality in child protective service systems, and too many children have had bad experiences in some group homes and in some foster homes. However, what we can't lose sight of is that there are children being hurt in their current living situation by those who they should be able to look to as their protectors. They are being sexually abused, physically hurt, and grossly neglected. In these situations, our goal should be to get these children to safe environments and out of unsafe ones. When children are being sexually abused, physically hurt, or grossly neglected, our goal must be to remove children from danger to safety, from unsafe situations to safe environments. Full stop. Our efforts at prevention seem to be focused on preventing kids from entering systems designed to protect kids rather than on preventing child abuse and child neglect. Our county, according to DFCS's prevention plan, has had rates of entry into the foster care system per capita well below the state average for years. In 2013, the state average was 3.4 per 1,000 children. Our county's was half that, 1.7. However, in 2022, our county's rate was 0.4 per 1,000 children compared to a statewide rate of 2.2 per 1,000 children, 80% lower than the state average. Sadly, since we've opened the Children's Advocacy Center in 2021, the number of abused and neglected kids we've seen there has grown dramatically. I point this out to say that if what we are measuring is reduced rates of entry into foster care, our county will turn our efforts toward that goal, that measurement. However, shouldn't our focus be to reduce the abuse and neglect of our children? As our community has learned, before baby Phoenix's death, filed cases in dependency court plummeted. Dependency court is where a judge has the job to make orders to protect children and to monitor whether those orders are being followed. There's a huge benefit of having a judge in a court with input from an attorney representing the child to make sure that parents are following through on the things needed to keep their children safe. Prior to baby Phoenix's death, those court filings and court monitoring have been replaced with voluntary services. Without court involvement, is there the needed oversight? 
How are those voluntary services being monitored for enrollment completion and success? How are the parents doing voluntary services checked in on? Most importantly, how are the vulnerable kids checked in on? I'm glad to learn that as part of its drug testing, DFCS will now be testing for fentanyl along with other drugs. That's a big and important change for the better. Thank you so much for holding this hearing and examining these difficult issues that we need to talk about in a frank and honest way. We're all here for all of our children. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. <laughs> James Gibbons Shapiro from the Child Abuse Prevention Council. Good afternoon. I'm James Gibbons Shapiro. I'm the chair of the Child Abuse Prevention Council. The Child Abuse Prevention Council is a commission of the Board of Supervisors made up, made up of professionals from social services, medical, legal, law enforcement, and many others with knowledge and experience in fields related to child abuse. Thank you, members of the board, for convening this hearing so we can bring to the four issues we've been discussing over the last year in the CAPC. In addition to the remarks you've heard, and we'll hear from others, I'd like to add a thought about the long-term needs of abused and neglected children. When we think about how to make a child safe, we understandably emphasize their immediate physical safety. But we know from research into the lifelong effects of adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, on kids, that the effects of abuse do not end when a wound is bandaged or the sexual perpetrator is not living with the child. The child's well-being depends on care for their emotional safety, for their long-term well-being, needs that must be met not just in the days after an abuse, abuse is discovered, but for weeks, months, and years after. And that means a consideration of whether a child is placed with an adult who is aligned with the child's abuser and who may not believe the child or support the child. And that means consideration not just for how a parent is doing programming or other services, but if the child is getting long-term trauma-informed counseling. And that means broader care for children so that we can help them not to be suicidal, which we've seen, not to turn to illegal substances for solace, which we've seen, and not to become abusers themselves when they are grown-ups with kids, which sadly we've also seen. As you consider a path forward uh, for our county, let's look to improve the ways that we can care for children beyond their immediate, immediate physical safety and to do better for their long-term needs. Lastly, we've heard, worked hard on the CAPC and in lots of committees and meetings on the county's child abuse protocol for law enforcement, on lots of best practices, on laws that allow for information sharing and for collaboration across siloed agencies. And we've done a lot to put on paper and to discuss how we're gonna do best in those instances. And the CAC really is a model in lots of ways of how to break down those silos. But we really can do better to not just write down in paper uh, what the protocol is, what we're gonna do for joint response, cross-reporting, participation in multidisciplinary interviews, and shared decision, make shared information for informed decision-making even as information changes. And so, I'm hopeful that um, as a result of this hearing and the work that I'm sure is, that's gonna follow, that we're going to be looking out more for that long-term well-being of kids and also to put into practice all the things that we've so thoughtfully put down on paper. I'll be here for any questions from the board uh, later and the CAPC looks forward to working with the board and all here to improve services for abused and neglected kids. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Don Taylor, uh, the CEO at Pacific Clinics, followed by Denise Marchu uh, from CAFPA. And um, I've been made aware that neither Judge Edwards nor Chief Mata uh, will be, are, are available today. So uh, Fred Ferrer, you will be after Denise. And if I'm incorrect and Judge Edwards or Chief Mata or someone else from SJPD is here, please let me know that and we'll fix it. Welcome, Don. 
Thank you, Supervisors, for establishing this special meeting. I'm Don Taylor, the Regional Executive Director of Pacific Clinics, one of a number of nonpar nonprofit partners providing services in the child welfare, juvenile justice, and behavioral health systems. Pacific Clinics has a 150-year-old history in this community and provides services to over 1,000 families in the child welfare system every year, aligning in the DFCS purpose to promote the well-being of children by ensuring safety, achieving permanency, and strengthening families. As a social worker myself, and as someone who's deeply committed to the community and who has worked across the spectrum of needs, I'm heartbroken over the loss of baby Phoenix. My heart goes out to the extended family, and this tragedy was not the expected result for any of those who intervened. Expecting they were doing the right thing for baby Phoenix and the family, and following policies and practices that supported safety and family. In that frame, I offer Pacific Clinic's perspective and suggestions on the child welfare system based on ours and other nonprofits' history, partnerships, and experience. Our, agent, our agency history in many ways follows the evolution of child welfare services and practices. We started many decades ago as a residential provider. We then launched with wraparound with the county and then collaborative collaboratively developed iterative services meeting the needs. These included intensive wrap, placement support services, and professional parents, all designed in response to high-risk behaviors and tragic situations. Our evolution also included the development of prevention services, including the launch of differential response and addiction prevention services. I share these examples to demonstrate the ability of county and partners to identify system issues, adjust, and make, need, make needed improvements. This is what a learning system does. It evolves through new practices and mistakes. Because CBOs are connected to communities in different ways than the county, this can lead to quicker access, including voluntary youth and families more likely to say yes to services. We offer the following recommendations to support the current child welfare system crisis, and these focus on quicker access to the full continuum of services. For differential response, allowing direct CBO referrals and access for any family that may be at risk. Currently, most referrals must come through the FCS. For wraparound, wrap referrals offered as part of a prevention path. This is the approach and it is supported in state prevention plans and moves away from the practice that other services must fail first before accessing RAP. While this is policy, practice needs help. For placement support services and ISS access before placement disruption and allow PSS to serve families even if no DFCS case is open. And for youth, Ages zero to five, focused supports and interventions, including co-referrals with Santa Clara County First Five and or building more expertise in other services. In short, these recommendations support the direct CBO streamline referrals and enrollments to quicken family access and move away from a fail-up mentality to front-loading front services to reduce the likelihood of families moving into crisis. It is moving from no wrong door to an all door mentality. And all the programs I mentioned have contracts that are underutilized. This doesn't require more funding, just a change in practice. We are ready to adapt to changes now and believe these practice changes could demonstrate immediate system impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, Denise. Good afternoon. Again, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to the table today. It's so important for our caregivers to have a voice, so I really appreciate this. Um, I am from CAFPA, which is the Kinship Adoptive Foster Parent Association in Santa Clara County. Uh, we currently serve over 300 kinship and adoptive and foster families. We also support social workers, uh, birth families, whoever walks into our resource center on Julian Street. Uh, they're one of our clients and we will support them however we can. We do many activities during the year with families. We also do surveys and talk to families every day. We have an advocate that supports our families and also a resource specialist. On behalf of our caregivers, I have a few statements today. We have seen the decline in children coming into the system during the past several years. We have questioned the decision and policies that have been keeping our children in harm's way. We are told over and over again that it is the law. If you ask caregivers, they are supportive of keeping families together, however, not at the detriment of the child. 
When a child's in the system, visitation should be therapeutic with assessment and follow through, assuring that while the child is in care, they are given every opportunity to reunite to a healthy, loving family. Many times we see families sitting there trying to work with children or, or connect with them, and someone is supervising, but there's no interaction. And we think it's so important that while the child is in care, that there needs to be someone really there teaching those families how to love each other, how to play together, how to work together. Caregivers speak on many prof to many professionals. Recently, when a doctor was asked what they would recommend for families, drug testing was the top of the list. Drug testing, no matter if it's a voluntary placement or a diversion or a child that is coming into the system, drug testing was the top of their list, and we agree. Diversion and voluntary placements have increased. However, there is little follow through and no representation of the child, and that needs to end. Someone needs to follow these children to assure them that they remain safe. Remember, they have no voice. There's a little child in the system now that, it, that is very critically ill and at any moment can go back home without any assessment being done to the family. And that's just not right. It just breaks our heart. And one final note, along with social workers and our community, our caregiver community mourns the loss of baby Phoenix especially knowing that we had many loving, safe arms that would have cared and loved that child. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Fred Ferrer, the CEO of Child Advocates of Silicon Valley, is going to wrap up this series of presentations. Thank you, President Eldenberg. Uh, Frederick Ferrer, CEO of Child Advocates of Silicon Valley. Um, for the last 36 years, the court-appointed special advocates or CASA program has been offered by Child Advocates of Silicon Valley. Currently, we serve about 300 um, young people in the foster care system, ages zero through 21 years of age. And they have a role in really three parts. A CASA is a mentor. They spend time directly with the child. And in court, oftentimes, they're the one who knows the child and all of the interests of the child really the best. But secondly, because we're officers of the court, different than other partners might be, we also have the ability to advocate within the system. Has the young person got to that counseling session? Do they have their glasses? What's going on at school? Oftentimes, the advocate is the one that can push in the system, but also then, because of our court order, can talk to everybody in the system. And the silos that we ask families and children to go through are horrendous. And finally, a CASA speaks directly to the court. So as the judges are making critically difficult decisions, they're able to ask the advocate, what's going on with the child? We are very concerned about disproportionality, especially when we see so many black, brown, and LGBTQ kids disproportionately represented in the system. We strive for culturally inclusive services, and we really work hard at trying to figure out what's the best way to serve children. We meet monthly with our, uh, our counterparts at DFCS. We work directly with social workers, and so we see on a daily basis the challenges of the siloed system we have that social workers, as hardworking as they can be, makes it really still difficult to overcome. We participate in the CFTs and try to figure out ways that we as CASAs can take parts of the jobs of different folks and really make sure things happen. We also then report directly to court and we oftentimes, we might disagree with a social worker or the county council uh, in terms of court, but it's, a, it's the place where we're supposed to have that disagreement. We're supposed to have that conversation so that the judges can make the best decisions possible. Our recommendations are really three. First, as a county board, continue to resource poverty. Continue to resource poverty. The challenges of homelessness, childcare, um, substance use, um, all the different kinds of parenting and family support services are the ways that neglect can be ameliorated if we can move families out of poverty. Secondly, Child Advocates continues to pledge support to work with the system and to work with DFCS, not only for the system's reform for children, but for the long-term health for families. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't remind us that child development matters. 
as my counterpart James just said, when we look at the issues of children, we have to look long term. So making a short term decision in the best interest of the child, it's going to always be a difficult decision to make. But we should couple that with what it, do we know about child development in terms of the long term effects. If we don't look at the literature and the research around trauma, and especially the, the looking at ACEs, <clears throat> the adverse childhood experiences, and what are those vehicles for positive childhood experiences to ameliorate the brain's effects of trauma on the child, we will be making a short-term decision, but we will have long-term consequences that we should know for each child and yet do nothing about. We can do better, so we must do better together. Thank you. I said at the outset that this hearing would be difficult. I didn't anticipate that it would also be heart-filling. The commitments that I heard today demonstrate that there are few real differences between the, view, the views shared here. To be sure, some advocates focused on the importance of preserving family structures whenever possible while acknowledging the necessity of removal in cases where the child would be in danger if allowed to remain in the home, while others expressed concern that we've leaned too far into family preservation at the expense of children's safety. I noticed that partners offering a variety of perspectives all received applause, which further shows me that either you are all super polite or that where we need to improve is really a matter of degrees as opposed to sea changes. Everyone wants to do better. Everyone wants clear, transparent, consistent standards and protocols and sufficient resources. Everyone wants to keep our children safe and to know the best way to do that. The overarching purpose of today's hearing was to get as many experts uh, with as many perspectives and types of relevant experience in front of the board as, as, as possible. We are the elected representatives. Uh, we are not all child safety experts, but we are charged with setting policy consistent with all state and federal laws. And everything that all of you have shared today is going to help inform how we guide our organization toward improved outcomes around a goal on which we already agree, children first. We're now going to hear from the public, who I expect will also have a great deal to teach us. Rhonda, do we have speakers in chambers and or on Zoom? Yes, I currently have 40 speaker cards and five speakers on Zoom, but that number is rising. Okay, so let me uh, review this with, with everybody. If you are in chambers and you're intending to speak, hopefully you have already submitted your yellow card. If you have not done so, now is the time to grab it. It's in the back of the room. Our practice is that when the first speaker begins speaking, the queue will close, and this is for meeting management purposes. Um, for those of you who are on Zoom, that queue will close when the first Zoom speaker begins speaking. So you have a little bit of, of extra time. We are allotting one minute. Um, certainly you are welcome to use some or all of that. And Rhonda will call groups of five. So if each group could line up in the aisle, that will help us move um, each person. And we, we really will be, be firm about the one minute time limit so that we can hear all of you. Thank you. I don't, do you see more cards heading down? I can't tell what's happening, but if there's another card, we need to get that now so we can begin. There's a couple? I do have okay. signals. We have a couple more coming okay. up. So we'll wait just a few minutes. It really is hard to see all the way back there. In the meantime, we couldn't get our first five speakers lining up. That's going to be Rico Mendez, Justo Valenzuela, Tony Cuevas, Angel Kelly, and Layla Turner. 
Thank you, Rhonda. I just want to make sure the first speaker doesn't begin until we have all of the, the cards so we don't have any confusion about when the queue closes. But when you're confident that you've got them all, we can begin. OK. Rico, you will be first, but just give us one second to make sure we've got all the cards. We're good? Looks OK. Like. So as Rico begins speaking, the queue for in-person speakers shall close. Welcome. To one, our proud union, representing social workers and many other workers here in Santa Clara County. Uh, it has been a really warming experience so far, hearing from these amazing advocates that care about these kids. The social workers here in Santa Clara County, they really do need support. They're on the front lines, and I know there's a lot of ideas about how we can improve this system to protect more children, help more families, create the best system of care for everybody that needs it in Santa Clara County. I represent social workers across many counties in California and see these issues happen in other counties as well. But what I'd love to say today is that those solutions, whatever they may be, the knowledge to create them is here. It's within the county. And one of the most important things that I would implore you all to do is make sure that the frontline worker, the people that are dealing directly with these families on the front lines, have a real seat at the table to contribute their knowledge and professionalism for the type of solutions that can protect these kids. They're here, they're smart, they're ready to contribute. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, my name is Justo Valenzuela. I come to you and speak to you in my Yoemi language. I am the social worker here at DOCS, but also co-chair to the Native American Employee Committee. I come to you and ask for you for support, to listen to our staff once again. Um, I was quoted earlier, and I, how Carla had mentioned, our children are sacred. Yes, they are. Our staff are sacred as well. And I want you all to consider, to take, take, a, take the wisdom that our workers are, 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 are sharing with you all. Um, their knowledge is, is very powerful. They have an abundance of information to support and move this county forward. Please be mindful of, of their thoughts, their hearts, their cries, everything that they're going through day in and day out, because I hear them out and I want to support them, and I think you all need to support them as well by listening to them, by bringing them to the table, hiring more staff, and, and also just considering everything in a tribal voice, Latino voice, African American voice, every community needs to be at this table. Thank you all. Hello, my name is Tony Cuevas. I'm a SSPM2 at DFCS. I'm also a SEMA liaison. Thank you for acknowledging the death of the baby. And I know we're all grieving in some way. I know that when the shame and blame started, especially when the social worker and supervisor were identified as being responsible, I could have gone into anger which is a normal stage uh, during uh, grieving and loss. When county council was blamed, I just want to say I love county council. I've, I've worked with them um, conducting <laughs> staffings to make clinical assessments. And that process of child and family safety staffings where groups make a decision, uh, clinical decision, that would be the best practice. Uh, SEMA and 521 are now working together and we've made some recommendations. Uh, and be inclusive of the uh, worker voice. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Angel Kelly, and I'm a supervisor in ER. When the changes in DFCS began, probate court was not told, but soon investigators began to raise concerns and question what was happening, that they were worried we were leaving children at high risk and dangerous situations. By December 2020, their concerns had reached an all-time high, and a subcommittee was created to address their concerns, but they were still not told. Probate court had concerns for the safety plans that were seen they were seen created with no background checks, clinical assessment, or assurance that those seeking guardianship were suitable would be approved or follow through. Nola Bates, the supervisor at the time, reached out to me and, explained the, and I explained the directive to her from DFCS. In disbelief, she noted that the law had not changed and stressed probate court was not like DFCS and could not offer services to address the concerns causing the harm. 
When Lula raised her concerns, my assistant director, Wendy Kinnear, admonished me, and my manager was directed to talk to me, citing that this was confidential and I could not say this again. We need trust and we need accountability if we're going to have change. If we could get our next five speakers coming forward, Patricia Muntis Gregory, Rachel Lopez, Dana Bennett, Gallardo Amador, and Claudia Marquez. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Layla Turner. I'm a senior attorney at Legal Advocates for Children and Youth. Um, I have worked there for nine years as minors counsel representing children in dependency. I'm here to show my support for the county social workers as professionals, um, and I would like to see them empowered to use their clinical skills um, in their assessments. Additionally, uh, I am concerned about the lack of clarity and accountability in the department's safety planning efforts over the past several years. It's not always clear to me who is involved in the safety planning, what the plan entails, and what kind of accountability there is. I would like more transparency on how the department will ensure that the people involved in safety planning are able and committed to following through on their part and what the next steps are to protect the child or children if the safety plans are not followed. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Patricia Montes Gregory. I am an advocate for Native American foster children. I'm currently trying to rescue seven children from their parents who are trafficking drugs, trafficking arms, and sex trafficking their children. We have three that are safe, but we still need to remove the other four. I'm working in Santa Clara County with Manuel Prado, and I want to thank all the CPS workers. And um, I have met with the FBI. They are taking over the investigation. I've met with the Attorney uh, General's Office, Office of Native American Affairs, Mary Lopez Kiefer, and we need training for CPS workers in the, in the Indian Child Welfare Act. It's desperately needed. Uh, Merced County refused to engage with us, with our tribal liaison, and as, as did Placer County, but Placer County got on board. We need to utilize technology. We live in the hub of technology, and we are not utilizing this technology. We need to update these systems so that the children are protected. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rachel Lopez. I have no affiliations. I'm, I am a second year law student and sharing my experience with DFCS. In 2018, I self-reported DV by my child's father. My victimization was then criminalized by DFCS and dependency court and I was targeted. My children were detained and the department violated WIC code 361.3 by prohibiting me from finding safe family placement. They actually said if I did not stop in coordinating, I would be arrested. My daughter had a seizure that night and I also WIC code 16501 was violated. I did not have a CFT meeting for over a year. My child was placed with her father who failed his case plan and adoption was set. I got no support from DFCS or the CASA advocate to reunify. I spent in excess of $70,000 in lawyers, expert witnesses, and self-paid services. In 2021, I won, in a, won my case in the Court of Appeals and the adoption was vacated. DFCS model is flawed. Children's futures are placed into the subjective discretion of individual social workers given many hats to wear, including their abilities to detain or not that they are not qualified to wear. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Claudia Marquez, a social worker for First Call for Families with Dependency Advocacy Center. I currently live in District 3. As a social worker, I conduct assessments to ensure families are safe. We cannot, although we cannot guarantee their safety, we can put safety measures in place. For instance, safety planning, relapse prevention plans, and referrals to community resources. Instead of acting out of fear, we should exhaust all other resources and services before the removal of our children. Studies show that children in foster care have experienced abuse, neglect, and other adverse childhood experiences that can negatively impact their health. In fact, half of our children in foster care have endured four or more uh, adverse childhood experiences. I urge the board to provide preventative support to our families, to provide accessible mental health resources, to keep children in their homes, and minimize the risk of children being put in the foster care system where they are at risk of further childhood adverse experiences. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Gildardo Amador. I'm a District 4 resident and a mentor parent for First Call for Families with the Dependency Advocacy Center Working in Prevention. Over two years ago, my daughter was removed from my custody at the age of one. After some time and working on myself, we were finally reunified. Instantly, I could tell that something was different. She was closed off and distant. And to this day, she has trouble sleeping through the nights, coming to the room looking for her parents. Case studies have shown that behavioral changes like this, as well as other neurological disorders, can be directly attributed to the effects of a child being removed from their parent. In my case, it was not removing my child that helped me change, but my love for her and the desire to be the best father that I could be. If I had been given the support and resources as a primary option before removal, she might have been saved from the lasting trauma it is still, she is still experiencing. I now work in prevention so parents and their children have a stronger chance in building a loving and stable home. I urge the board to note the many years of research showing the harmful effects of removing a child from a parent and the importance of early prevention efforts rather than removal as a staple to breaking the cycle. Thank you. If we could get our next five coming forward, Alondra de Santiago, Parrish Green, Victoria Ruiz, Lindsay Packard, and Anna Navarez. Um, good afternoon, Dana Bunnett, Executive Director of Kids in Common. Um, I believe um, I am heartbroken too about Phoenix's death. However, I also want to help us think about how to not overcorrect. Um, I've had several young people in my life over the years, pre-COVID, um, where I, they were in the foster care system or on probation, and I. They were best, the best teachers to me in terms of what we need to do to improve our systems. Um, I think what Fred Ferrer spoke about with addressing poverty is an extremely important step to take. Um, there have been natural experiments where um, families get $5,000 extra a month, and in those communities, child welfare cases went down. Um, I do think we do need to look at our substance use, use treatment programs. Um, there was a great article this week in New York Times about improvements and innovations there. Um, I think those systems can do harm if we're not careful. And the last thing I wanted to say is that social justice activist Brian Stevenson said, justice is when people get what they need when they need it. Good afternoon, my name is Alondra de Santiago and I am a social worker with the Corridor Program at Dependency Advocacy Center. I am here today to urge the Board of Supervisors to explore, consider, and implement alternatives to remedy the impact that the trauma of family separation causes to all family members. As a social worker that works with families in the community, I see the need for families to be connected to culturally appropriate resources that can provide ongoing individualized support. This can make a huge difference in bridging language and cultural gaps and developing a better engagement with parents and natural support systems that go beyond short-term compliance to actually bring forth lasting, long-term behavioral change, healthier families, and more protective communities. By focusing on early intervention and supporting at-risk families, we are collaboratively working to promote family integrity and protect against the trauma of family separation. Thank you. My name is Paris Green. I am a mentor parent with the Dependency Advocacy Center. I stand before you as a father who has had his children removed five times and lost a son to adoption. I take full responsibility for the role my addiction played in the department's involvement with my family. However, removal harmed my children in ways that they have never healed from. My boys have both spent time in prison and while my girls have built families of their own, they fear abandonment and being alone to this day. If the child welfare system is designed to keep children safe, then what it needs to achieve is a healthy engagement with families. A healthy engagement is when removal is the last resort, not a de facto policy. When parents are st steered towards resources in the community connected to mentor parents with lived experience and other natural supports, this is proven to create successful outcomes. I respectfully demand healthy engagement for families. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Lindsay Packard. I'm a social worker with a corridor program at the Dependency Advocacy Center. Today, I urge the board to consider the impact the removal of children and their involvement in the child welfare system has on their health and well-being and to move forward with a trauma-informed practice to better support our community. According to re research by the California ACEs Aware Initiative conducted in 2021, they found that long-term out-of-home placement has been correlated with many negative outcomes for children. Even short-term removal can cause long-lasting trauma to children 
to families. Infants that have been removed from parents, even temporarily, show insecure attachment styles and develop physical and mental health issues. This research shows that youth placed into foster care have higher rates of delinquency, teen pregnancy, economic disadvantage, homelessness, and incarceration than their peers. This evidence is a small piece that shows that child removal should be a last resort for the health of all children. I urge the board to make a continued commitment to letting evidence rather than events drive policy. Good afternoon, my name is Victoria Reese and I have been working with DAC as a mentor parent for 11 years. Five of those years have been doing prevention work. I urge you to continue to support prevention services and family preservation. 15 years ago, my son was removed from my care. While I was given a chance to participate in voluntary services, I had no support. I didn't have access to a mentor parent or an attorney as my own pre-petition clients have today through DAC's prevention programs. When my son was removed from my care, he was also removed from his community, extended family, and placed out of county. Blowback was changing elementary schools six times due to removal from my care. This prevented him from ever being able to build healthy relationships. While I reunified to this day, my son continues to struggle with intimacy. He, he isolates, lacks a social life, and uses cannabis to medicate his depression, anxiety, and chronic stress. I know he never recovered from the trauma of being separated from me. Thank you. If we could have our next five speakers step forward. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry. Got to go. Sorry. Hillary Cushions, Sarah Cook, Steve Barron, <laughs> Meredith Wallace, Mauricio Perez. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Navarez. I'm a resident, District 2, an employee at Dependency Advocacy Center. As a mentor parent, I bring my personal experience with the child welfare system, having endured the loss of my daughter to CPS. At the time she was removed from me, I asked for help many times and never got the support I needed from the community. I was prepared to turn my life around with the right support, but CPS believed instead the solution was to remove my daughter. Although we were eventually reunited, the trauma from that loss still lingers inside me until this day. Because of my experience, I'm an advocate for belief that every parent deserves an opportunity to change their life without the fear of losing their children. I firmly believe that more prevention programs are needed, programs that assist parents with problems they face, such as mental health, housing, substance use. Many parents in our county are living in poverty and need help accessing these resources. I urge the county to make supportive um, services accessible to all families without the fear of losing their children. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mauricio Perez, and I'm here to say that although Baby Phoenix's uh, death is a tragic story, it's not the first story, and it's been going on for a long time, and it's not the worst story. And for people to say that I didn't know, I didn't know, well, guess what? Everybody here knows, and everybody's been knowing it's been going on for a long time, and a lot of people want to blame social workers and say it's them and say it's them. From being here, I've seen it's not them. It's supervisor. It's management. It's people above. I personally have seen emails that gone all the way up to state, and, now, and I've seen two weeks ago, I've seen the media has known, but none of that has come out. Everybody wants to play, say the blame game and say this and say that, but guess what? The cat's out of the bag. We all know now, so so what are we going to do to fix it and stop hiding from it? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Hillary Cushions. I've been a dependency attorney for 23 years in this county and a co-founder of Dependency Advocacy Center. The decreases in cases coming into dependency court in this county is part of an overall state and national trend, and for good reason. What we didn't recognize then to a degree and what we recognize now is the trauma that families experience when there is a child removal, that even the briefest of separation is harmful to them. If the services available now to families in the community without court were available to the parents and children I represented a decade ago, in many of those cases there would never have been a need to remove that child to keep that child safe. Under the law, removal and court intervention should be the last resort. For the emotional well-being of families, parents, and children alike, I ask the Board of Supervisors help to ensure that we continue to do everything we can to support and stabilize families before court intervention so we don't unnecessarily traumatize communities for generations to come. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Cook, and I'm an attorney with Dependency Advocacy Center. The child welfare system is often described as a pendulum that swings between maximizing child protection on one side and promoting family preservation on the other. These concepts, however, do not need to be mutually exclusive. While there are some children who can only be protected by removal, there are still many children whose short-term safety and long-term well-being are best protected through family preservation. We pride ourselves on doing things differently in this county, so I challenge this board to avoid the impulse to respond reactively in this moment. Consider all the evidence, all the data, all the research, all the history, and all the narratives, including the collective wisdom of system-impacted families. I urge the board to support child welfare policies and practices that are narrowly tailored, that mandate reasonable efforts, because that's what, thank you. Thank you. Hi. I'm Meredith Wallace. I'm a parent's attorney in dependency at Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. I prepared comments on the harms of designing policy based on moral outrage generated by statistical outliers like child maltreatment fatalities. But instead, I want to tell you that almost every parent who has come to our team for assistance in prevention is a former foster youth. And they are coming, the reason they're cold calling an attorney for help for issues related to substance abuse and concern for their children is because the state severed their natural support system and then tossed them into the world with no ability to deal with that loss. The state makes a horrible parent, and it knows this. That's why the structured decision-making risk assessment, which the county described as helpful in decision-making, gives you an additional point if you were formally in foster care as a child, which then increases your odds of having your child removed. Adults are also sacred, and they deserve our support and protection. Thank you. Good afternoon. Steve Barron uh, retired from the probation department when we used to do child abuse work in the child sexual abuse treatment program and family court. We need, and are currently on the child abuse council and uh, domestic violence and child death review teams. We need to rein in a child welfare reform movement that years ago encouraged constructive changes, but since 2020 in our county evolved into a radicalized ideology which is currently endangering the very children, particularly children of color it proclaims to be helping. We need to restore an administratively supported balance to DFCS response which aims to provide early accurate identification of abuse and neglect, focusing, uh, focusing first and foremost on safety, and that should include, when appropriate, the protections and accountability provided by court oversight, attorney representation for abused and neglected children, eligibility for the point, uh, appointment of court-appointed special advocates, all of which was uh, four to 500 children in, in 2022, same amount 2023, were Thank deprived. You, by DFCS. Thank you very much. Our next five speakers are Mark Trout, Jennifer Solea, Alex Lesniak, Catherine Campbell, and Janice Clark. It's okay to come forward in any order. Thank you. Catherine Campbell with um, National Safe Parent Organization. I'm here today because the county failed my family. Uh, for over 13 years, my children had to live with their child sexual abuser, their father. We have over 12 CPS reports. We have multiple um, cases within, um, with, it, with the police. It wasn't one office, it was everyone who refused to listen to the cries of child sexual abuse. At 18, they were able to walk away from their abuser. Until then, we spent $2 million to try, I tried to keep them safe. I don't think anyone should have to spend their life savings. I have ideas of how to move this forward, but we should recognize that there is a safe parent and to be told we can only remove them from both of you is unacceptable. 
I was always a safe parent, and instead, I lost custody. Hi, I'm Jennifer Salaya. I'm with New Beginnings Fam uh, Family Services. Um, I just want to extend my condolences to Baby Phoenix's family. Um, this death could have been prevented, although I have bridged the gap um, with working with the department and the families. I've been a victim of uh, the board. I've lost my first child at 15, 26 years ago. I have been working with families, and um, I haven't seen any accountability from the board. Okay, and I see all the blame going around about this baby's death instead of taking accountability. I've been one of those parents that have been advocating and blowing the whistle, not only to the board, to the state, to district attorney, to social services in regards to issues like this. This could have been prevented, and I've been giving resources the last 26 years to prevent situations like this. So again, take accountability for once, okay? Um, thank you for this hearing. I'm Janice Clark. I'm one of the chief stewards for SEIU 521. And also, I'm a psychiatric social worker for the Addiction Medicine Treatment Program. And we provide treatment for individuals who are addicted to fentanyl and other illicit opiates. I basically echo the same sentiments as our community members and also our employees and also the board that we do need additional staffing and resources to assist families and to assist individuals to overcome um, addiction and also to protect our families and our children. Thank you. And if I could get the next five coming forward, Sean Allen, Edward Marilla, Zeb Feldman, Marianne Waddell, and King Surrender. Thank you for holding this hearing or meeting. I'm still not completely sure which this is. Uh, my name is Alex Lesniak, and um, I would like to just be sure that we have a clear distinction between the difference of shaming and blaming, which nobody here wants, but also responsibility and accountability. We've heard today from our workforce and our many partners that the issues that brought us here today were flagged for years. The concerns were predicted. I urge the board to continue partnering with the social workers and the supervisors to have a more balanced understanding of what went wrong. In the unbalanced power dynamics of worker to executive chain of command, it is up to our leaders to seek out and invite those of us who can speak from a direct practice perspective. Thank you for your continued commitment to a sustained solution. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Allen. I'm the third vice president and legal redress chair for the Silicon Valley branch of the NAACP. First and foremost, it is our position that this, there is nothing more pure and innocent than the lives of, the children, lives of the children. Ideally, children should remain with their families. With that being said, the DFH DFCS is the DFCS is primarily um, uh, excuse me primarily function is to safeguard the lives and rights of children. The county executive has acknowledged the failures associated with the loss of this baby, but that's not enough. The executive of the, of the DFCS and his employees are the uh, are the experts in the field, not the lawyers. We support Director Wright and the war, and the work of his employees, the NACP is aware and concerned with the fact that the children being taken from their families are disproportionately brown and black kids. Our organization will continue to monitor this practice and patterns and associate to removing children from their families. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Zeb Feldman with SEMA. This is a somber and stressful time. However, I'm proud to see SEMA and SEIU staff are meeting that challenge together. We urge the board's leadership in social services. We have specific requests centered around action, accountability, and restoration. For action, we are asking that the flurry of practice changes just implemented include the manager and social worker in all county, in all conversations with county council with a clear escalation plan understood by all, should there be any disagreement. 
<clears throat> for accountability, we ask for an independent investigation outside of SSA and County Council be conducted. We also ask that we turn away from the feast of finger pointing taking place in the media and focus on bettering the strong services we provide every day. For restoration, we ask for all DFCS positions, manager and worker alike, to be unfrozen to meet our family's needs for services. Listen to your hard workers with action, accountability, and restoration. Thank you for your kind attention. Hi, I'm Surinder Cardaliwal. I am your king, regardless of what you think. I'm also a candidate for San Jose City Council District 8. Every child on this planet is my child, regardless of their race, gender, physical, or mental disability. And I will hold every one of them in my heart and my prayers, including all the children in Gaza. Your family court judges and attorneys are corrupt, Children are being trafficked through this system. More harm is being done than good. As this corrupt family court system continues to crumble before our eyes, you need to start thinking about how we are going to rebuild it to be fair and just and protect our children. I hold each of you responsible for protecting my children in your jurisdiction. Their freedom and their chance of a joyful life is being stripped from them because we as a humanity have failed we in Santa Clara have failed. My name is Edward Murillo, and uh, I'm the, the uncle of uh, Emily and uh, baby Phoenix. You know, uh, Emily was well-loved. She was a descendant of a Mamutsin uh, band of California Mission Indian from San Juan Batista, California. You know, our, our history is strong, and we took care of our, our children. They were a priority. All life is sacred, especially the children, especially the mothers. And this tragedy could have been avoided. You know, I've been sober for... 32 years, but have also worked for the county for 32 years in the elections division. You know, uh, my heart is broken in many ways, uh, listening to the folks that are suffering here with their families makes me realize the scope of what's happening in our county. Thank you much, very much, sir, for speaking, and my condolences to your family. I just want to say that, that I hope that good will come out of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if we could have our final speakers in chambers come forward, that would be Sparky Harlan, Sander Gregory, Fobui, Mamut Nuhu, and Goldie. Good afternoon. My name is Marianne Waddell, and I'm a social work supervisor at DFCS at the hotline. I'm also a member of SIU and the vice chair for the supervisor chapter and a resident of District 2. Understaffing at SSA affects the well-being of most of the vulnerable population in our community, including children, elderly, individuals experiencing homelessness, those with disabilities, those with mental illness, and those with substance addiction. As to, to a, a quote that everyone should know, you can't take care of anyone else unless you take care of yourself. Well, board, we need your help. I want to urgently stress the need for staff at DFCS, and particularly at the hotline, to ensure the timely comprehensive assessments for initial support needed for our commu community's most vulnerable members, our children. Thank you. Thank you, supervisors and county executives. My name is Fobui. I am a psychiatric social worker one and chief steward for SEIU 521 within the Behavioral Health Department. I am here to echo the sentiments from my peers from DFCS. I am pleading with the boards and the executives 
to reinforce the availability and accessibility to services and resources in this community. But first, we must look at the current shortage of our workforce as evident by our high volume of vacancies. I'd like to ask the boards and the executives a question. How are we delivering services and resources when our workforce is shrinking despite the growing problems of fentanyl and mental illness in this community? Please hire more clinicians and social workers. Thank you. Well, I didn't think I'd be back so soon, Sparky Harlan, <laughs> former CEO of Bill Wilson Center. But I'm also still the policy chair of the National Network for Youth, where just two weeks ago, we talked about the national implications of Families First, where you have teenagers who are sleeping on the floor in offices and cubicles for months and years because they're fighting, trying to get into foster care at age 14, but nobody's filing petitions on them. Unattended consequences. We've been looking at the data since 2012. What we can tell you is group homes who provided drug treatment had high percentages of family reunifications. Runaway programs, high percentage of family reunification. Bill Wilson Center is the only residential program left in this county. So what are we doing is workarounds. We now have HUD saying housing can be provided. Thank you very much, Sparky. Anyway, we'd love to talk. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sandra Gregory, and I'm a social worker with DFCS and an SEIU 521 member. Since my employment in 2019, I have worked for the department as a dependency investigation social worker, an emergency response social worker, and a placement social worker. When the department leadership rolled out directives to reduce the number of children remo removed from their families in the name of reducing disproportionality, many social workers, including myself, saw the writing on the wall that there would be grave consequences. We were directed to refer families to community services that were not suited to effectively address the safety concerns present or to create safety plans that were unsustainable and insufficient to truly provide for the safety of the children in danger. I and many of my colleagues were vocal about our fears that the consequence would cost a child their life. Instead, our concerns were dismissed. I respectfully implore this board to consider thoughtful, intentional shifts to policy and practice to ensure that our system does not fail another child. Please listen to and heavily consider the voices of those who see the families we serve day in and day out. Please demand accountability from agency and department leaders and demand transparency and decision. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. My name is Mamut Nuhu, co-founder of Culturally Coordinated Services and also minister of the House of Sankofa. I want to be very, very clear with you all. I'm here today uh, to send a revolutionary salute out to the Red Nation who has uh, lost a young person who, had, who would have had the capability to do so much had given that opportunity. Uh, in all reality, I want to be very, very clear. Uh, we hear a lot about the needs of additional funds for those frontline workers, uh, yet I would encourage everyone to think in, about the reality of all of the frontline workers that are already in place in the community via the aunties, the uncles, the grandmothers, and so on and so forth. And if the county, if social workers are complaining about amount, the amount of funds that they have to do the work that's needed, imagine the discrepancy in the funds that the community have to access, uh, the, the, the funds that the community have to, to utilize to assist some of these families in the struggles that they're having that's leading to these removals. Revolutionary salute, thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah, and I want to come and speak to you about something very personal. My father was a drug addict. He overdosed on heroin in someone's lawn all by himself. So with that being said, drugs are a huge, huge issue in this society. Because of my mother using the resources that you guys at that time had available for her, I was able to get into counseling. I was able to go into school, college, and get my life on the opposite track of that. So these resources for these families are actually so imperative to have. As an indigenous person, our children are sacred to us. So my daughter has autism and I utilize the same resources that my mother used for me, for my child, and they are amazing for her. And I'm very grateful for that. 
but we do have to have it proportional for everybody. Our black and brown children are suffering, and I think that's, it's, it's hard to say why, but we need to focus and make sure that it's evenly proportionate for everyone. Thank you. President Ellenberg, that does conclude our in-person speakers. We currently have 13 on Zoom. Thank you. I will uh, remind uh, listeners on Zoom that if you intend to make public comment, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. The queue for Zoom, Zoom speakers will close when the first speaker begins speaking. So we'll give that a few seconds and look to see if the number increases. Holding firm at 13. Um, Looks like we went up to 14. All, All right. right, let's proceed with 14, thank you. All right, our first speaker is Jeremy Barros. Jeremy, we've asked you to unmute. Good afternoon, my name is Jeremy Barros, Director of Policy and Organizing with Amigos de Guadalupe, Center for Justice and Empowerment. I'm urging the board to accept the referral authored by Supervisors Chavez and Arenas. Amigos de Guadalupe serves over 5,000 East San Jose families per year through all of our programs and services, and want to thank you for discussing opportunities to improve systems and how we serve children and families in our county so that their needs are addressed and met in an intentional and equitable manner. The joint board referral by Supervisors Arenas and Chavez calls on our county and community to do better and identify where our systems are failing to prevent our children from falling between the cracks. This is certainly a big step in the right direction to support families the best we can to ensure that they can deal with the challenges they are facing. This is why I'm urging the Board of Supervisors to support the referral on behalf of our county's children and meet this moment to analyze data trends and patterns to best understand the Our next speaker is Paul Soto. Paul, I've asked you to unmute. Paul Soto. Our next speaker is Maggie Cocaine. Maggie, we've asked you to unmute. Hi, I'm both a practicing dependency attorney and county licensed resource parent for over a decade. As with many tragedies, the pendulum often swings too far in one direction or another. We have already seen an increase in removals, but we can't go back to the way things were with over removals because protecting children is not just about removals. We can't lose sight of the fact that research shows removals harm kids and causes trauma, but we also can't turn a blind eye to risk, not remove, not support, and only hope for the best. We need a robust, sufficiently staffed, and accountable prevention program to support families and protect children. Children diverted to family court and probate guardianship also need support, if not more. I thank the board for close attention to this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jose F. Jose Fontanillo, we ask you to unmute. Hi, my name is Jose Fontanillo, DAC Corridor mentor parent and a person who has struggled with addiction for over 10 years. I'm a father of an amazing child. His birth was the catalyst for me to want to change my life. <clears throat> when my son was born, I was still struggling. I was homeless in San Jose and living in a shelter in the begin and in the beginning of my recovery journey. I cannot imagine what my life would have gone to if and in that moment my son would have been taken away from me. I asked the Board of Supervisors to recognize that most families have the capacity to solve their own problems if given the opportunity. All they need are resources and support and I am an example of that. As a mentor parent, I'm working with prevention clients and helping other fathers do the same. If we truly want to protect children from mo we must continue talking about prevention and not just about increasing removals. In my situation, removal would have been having an inflictive and completely avoidable and unnecessary harm to my child. That is not something this board should tolerate in the name of children's protection. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jamie. Please accept the unmute. Go ahead, Jamie. Jamie, we're unable to hear you. Can you try again? 
We'll move forward. Roman R, we've asked you to unmute. Thank you. Um, I just want to bring to your attention the pressing issue of burnout, staff shortage, and hard call volume in our child abuse neglect center. I want to stress the issue of burnout. Seeing as how the dedicated staff of the child abuse neglect center work tirelessly to protect vulnerable children in our community, due to the demanding nature of our work, coupled with the emotional toll it takes, it has led to a significant increase in burnout, which has not only affected the well-being of our staff members, but also compromises the quality of services provided to those in need. Another issue is staff shortage, which, is brought up, which has been brought up multiple times. Lastly, um, the cancer center has been inundated with a high volume of calls. The increase in call volume also leads to longer wait times for callers, potentially jeopardizing the safety and well-being of children in urgent need and assistance. Please keep in mind that in addition to high call volume, we are also working on walking reports, police reports, written scars, and other special protocols such as probate court, petition, and 241s, all of which are assigned on a weekly basis. We are requesting that the Board of Supervisors approve the CAN Center for another evening shift in unit and social work supervisor, which will only alleviate the burden on the assistant team and will enable staff to handle calls more promptly and efficiently. Victor Vasquez, please accept the unmute. Hello, uh, County Board of Supervisors. Thank you for this time. Um, we want to just remind ourselves that this is part of a larger institutional problem that we all know about from slavery, Native American boarding schools, to families being separated at the border from their children. It's, it's another example of why Black and Latino children are overrepresented in removal from their families. And you know we are outraged at times to hear the over-policing of our families where families are being called, CPS is being called on them for like minor issues that, are, that have nothing to do with CPS, but it has a lot more to do with who they are and where they live. We're, outrageous, we're also outraged, uh, outraged to hear how women who are suffering DV have also had their children taken away and criminalized in this, in this process as well. So we concur with our partners that we need to figure out universal solutions in addressing poverty from basic needs, positive parent and youth development, financial empowerment, and health and well-being to address this issue at a systematic level as well. Thank you. Jose Martinez, please accept the unmute. Jose Martinez Saldana, please accept the unmute. Hello, uh, my name is Jose Martinez Saldana. I want to go ahead and thank the Board of Supervisors for allowing this time to speak. Uh, I work with Youth Alliance, an agency that works with over 5,000 youth annually uh, and their parents in the southern part of the county as well as uh, San Benito County. Uh, the board has adopted a, as a top policy priority to enhance support for children and families. By voting to support Supervisor Reynos and Chavez's board referral, you demonstrate and reaffirm that commitment. Joint board referral for Supervisor uh, Arenas and Chavez calls on our county and community to do a better job uh, identifying where our systems are failing to prevent our children from failing, falling between the cracks. Uh, I urge the Board of Supervisors to support the Arenas Chavez board referral on behalf of our county's children and meet this moment to analyze the data trends, patterns, uh, uh, to best understand the changes we must make and take into account this call to action by Pat, Patty Andrade, please accept the unmute. Hello, my name is Patty Andrade. I am a resident of District 1, a member of the Evergreen Board of Trustees, and I am here to speak as a parent. I am speaking today to urge the Board of Supervisors to support the Joint Board Referral by Supervisors Arenas and Chavez. The Joint Board Referral by Supervisors Arenas and Chavez calls on our county and community to do better and identify where our systems are failing to prevent our children from falling between the cracks. We must ensure that children are prioritized, prioritized, and this is why I am urging the Board of Supervisors to support the Arenas and Chavez Board referral on behalf of our county's children and meet this moment. Um, thank you very much, and I look forward to the approval. Shannon A., please accept the unmute. Good evening, Board of Supervisors. My name is Shannon Arrojo. I have been a foster parent for the last um, 11 years. And I just urge you to, um, to really look into what's going on right now, um, especially cases that are being deferred to probate and family courts where children don't have, um, often don't have any legal voice. Um, 
we we worked hard to help our um, our children stay um, reunified with the parents, but even with the supports in place, they are still suffering. Thank you. Thank you. Adam Trigg, please accept the unmute. Hello, I've been a foster parent in the county for more than a decade. We have fostered more than two dozen children and adopted seven children through foster care. Um, I didn't plan to speak here, but um, I thought foster parents should have a bit of a voice in this. Um, you know, when we first started fostering, we got calls very regularly for placements. Um, but more recently, not so often, we heard from other foster parents that calls were uh, reducing as well. We weren't really sure why, but then I heard uh, District Attorney Rosen's statement about how much removals have lowered in the county. Um, and there's really one of two options. Either there was way, over, way too much removal before, or there are many children who were um, left in vulnerable situations. And I just want to say that um, this is supposed to be focused on the kids, and there are plenty of foster parents ready and willing to help those kids um, that need to be removed to be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Suzanne Frank, please accept the unmute. Hi, my name is Suzanne Frank. I'm a pediatrician at School Health Clinics of Santa Clara County. I'm retired from Kaiser San Jose uh, Pediatrics. And what I'm calling on is the Board of Supervisors to support us in Santa Clara County to reinstate our multidisciplinary team, our suspected child abuse and neglect team that meets, would meet monthly with a law enforcement, DAs, um, CPS, and medical from all medical providers in the county to review cases to give a multidisciplinary approach and follow up. And in the past, county council has been a barrier to this, so we implore them to uh, comply with California state law, as is done in Sacramento County and other counties throughout the state, and reinstate our multidisciplinary team to review cases for best practice and follow up. Thank you. Paul Soto, please accept the unmute. Uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I want to thank Victor Bosquez for his uh, historical perspective on the foster care system. The foster care system was instituted as the residential school program by a, name, by a man named Richard Lewis in the 1880s. So, there, there, so it's no wonder that there is still this kind of racialized um, capacity within the foster care system and that it's deadly to that constituency. That, that is not a surprise to me. What, what we need to do is have that historical perspective. These are racial equity issues. I've been on you guys for the longest. These are racialized equity issues. And until you stop with your just empty rhetoric and start really actually instituting concrete policies, you're putting the Chicano and the Africano communities at risk. And our final speaker on public comment is Crystal Mendoza Velardo. Good afternoon. My name is Crystal Mendoza Velarde, and I am an attorney with Dependency Advocacy Center. Through our quarter program, I represent parents in open dependency cases, as well as on a preventative basis. I would like to comment on how black and brown families are disproportionately represented in the child welfare system and demand that this not be ignored by the Board of Supervisors. Looking at Santa Clara County data from 2017, Latino children represented 70% of the children in foster care but only 35% of the community as a whole. And African-American children represented 10.7% of the children in foster care and only 2.1% of the population. Racial disproportionality is not a guise. It is sadly the reality of our child welfare system. Department practices that seek to address this should be applauded, not disparaged. And the board must continue to critically question the disproportionate impact that policies of family separation have on our most vulnerable families. Thank you. And this concludes our public speakers. 
Thank you very much. And thank you, really deeply thank you to all of the public speakers who, who joined us today on Zoom and in the room. Uh, you truly do add so much information and perspective to, to the issues that are before us and just want to express my gratitude and again the support that you've shown for one another and for um, for really looking at, at how we move forward together. So much gratitude. It is uh, now time for the Board of Supervisors to begin our discussion, and I am going to turn first to uh, Supervisor Chavez, who is on the big screen. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, and I, I just want to say thank you to everybody who spoke today. Your comments were incredibly powerful, and one of the things that everybody had in common is that we all recognize what we're doing isn't working. Um, and so this is an opportunity for us to lean in deep and do the hard work that we know needs to be done. Um, you know, I, I um, as the chair of the Children's Family Seniors Committee, um, Supervisor Arenas and I discussed whether or not this should come to committee. And we both agreed that this was really a, a discussion that has to be had with the full board. Um, the great news about that is, is that based on today's um, feedback and the um, and an action we took last Tuesday, we will be hearing this issue throughout the year, different components of it um, at the full board level. And I think that's incredibly important to demonstrate how important children are in our community, all children are in our community, to make sure that the entire board is playing a leadership role in working with all of you to address these issues. We, um, Supervisor Arenas and I met with um, parents and foster parents and the courts and family members of um, both children who'd been removed and children who hadn't, um, law enforcement, our social workers, and many, many, many advocates in the community to better understand all of your perspectives. You know, I think one thing that got re reinforced for me today is just the complexity of, of these issues, which I know all of you know um, I too want to just acknowledge the pain and suffering that we have in our community. And I wanted Ed Morillo, um, uh, Phoenix's uh, great grandfather, just hearing you make that comment about something good must come of this. You're exactly right. Your words are the ones I want to think most about um, today. I, w I am really honored that uh, to work with Sylvia. One thing that we did was we, we put together a referral, uh, really a motion in advance of the meeting so that we'd all have something to start with. It's not the end, it's not the, uh, um, you know, the, the final. It really was intended to be just the backbone of how we were gonna proceed today. So I wanted to ask my colleague, uh, Supervisor Arenas, who I've so appreciated her leadership on this, to perhaps walk us through the, um, the motion so that I, I will second it so that we can have something for the board to be able to discuss and move forward with. Thank you. Board President. Supervisor Arenas, please. Oh, okay. I, I wanted to make sure that that was part of the process. I thought we were going to ask questions, but we'll do this first if that's okay with you. Absolutely, go right ahead. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. So today's um, motion is really um, a lot of work that is reflected in our memo um, that comes from all of you. I want to first thank um, all of uh, the folks who uh, took a chance, took a risk, and shared um, with us who were very vulnerable. Um, we recognize how much you are putting at stake. Uh, this is your livelihood for some of you, and for some of you, this you're a key stakeholder, you're an advocate, you're a supporter, and so all of your voices together collectively have, um, we hear them. And I know that in the past you, you must have been felt, or it sounds like to me, that you weren't heard. And I assure you, we will continue to hear you, we hear you now and we'll continue to hear you. So I'm gonna start out with this um, motion. For those of you who didn't get a chance, and we apologize, this was a four-page uh, memo or legislative file, um, 
And under that, we have um, a section that is Section 8, and these are recommendations relating to staffing and personal concerns. So the first one would be to request that administration and county council release a robust statement that the Department of Family and Children's Services, social workers, county council attorneys, and any other county staff, foster care parents, or nonprofit partners will not be retaliated against for raising concerns about systems and processes. This countywide statement should make clear that everyone's voice deserves to be heard who is willing to invest in solving this problem. We also ask to immediately exclude from the countywide hiring freeze all line staff positions at DFCS, including social workers and supervisors. Three. Three, we ask to report to the board in closed session in advance of any personal decisions at DFCS above the position of program manager, including any decisions to hire executive staff. Four, report to the board on steps to achieve a balanced process for DFCS cases based on best practices, including how to right size and rebalance staffing levels using the best tools and mechanisms inside DFCS to align with workload. How to refine county council's participation to ensure it allows DFCS staff to follow best practices, including reporting on the potential resumption of staffings, which we understand were really important for social workers, their supervisors, county council, and other appropriate staff to collaborate on decisions regarding individual cases. Five, report to the board regarding staffing levels and caseloads at DFCS currently. Information on staffing changes necessary to align with board direction and a proposal to, board, to the board on steps to achieve appropriate staffing levels unit by unit. Report to the board with options to ensure the appropriate and adequate staffing levels at the Child Advocacy Center in order to, for all child survivors of abuse to receive medical care from the CAC medical team. I'm going to move on to Section B. Um, please be patient, but I think you'll like it. Um, information and clarification on existing laws and regulations around our child welfare system. One, it's to provide the board with a timeline starting in 2020 with policy and practice changes made to DFCS, including formal changes made to the online policies and procedures and DFCS foster care handbook, but also comprehensive analysis of additional changes to informal policies and practices. Report back to the board in closed session, if necessary, on the evolution of county council's change in interpretation of the legal standards for the removal of children from the custody of their parents, as well as evolutions of direction DFCS provides social workers regarding the role of county council in making determinations and the discretion that DFCS retains. Three, report back regarding hospital release and transfer protocols where a DFCS report has been made both for county and non-county hospital hospitals. Report back with a detailed oh, four. Report back with a detailed a data on the past three years of clinical death review cases where there has been a report to DFCS and a CAN Center call. Um, I'm also going to add here um, there was a clinical uh, there was a child death review task force that was mentioned in a DFCS report, and I'd like to also ask for that data to be included. Five, report back with the detailed data regarding children in the probation system who have an access to DFCS, including the number of previous CAN um, center calls and DFCS reports, as well as data on substantiated abuse, including a report back with analysis of these data trends over time and options to research whether recent child welfare practice trends have, are having an impact on the number of youth with juvenile justice involvement. C, we're moving on to status updates on current programs and services. Report on the status of all recommendations made at this special board meeting and meeting with the president of the board to schedule a workshop or special meeting on this topic. Report on the status of all recommendations made in 2023 by the California Department of Social Services, including in their February 2023 communication. Three, report back on the plan to finalize updated sexual assault response team, SART, protocol, including a timeline with a three to six month window for completion. D, we're moving on to recommendations relating to new requests and programs. One, it's to provide the board with a joint report from the administration, county council, and the office of the clerk of the board with options for the board of supervisors to directly contact one, A, an agency outside to manage an independent whistleblower process, an independent investigator, 
I told you you would like it. <laughs> An independent investigator to manage concerns and inquiries that would typically be investigated internally. Two, policy options for the board to consider that would allow for increased oversight of cases where appropriate, even when there isn't a re uh, removal. Options should include expanding the number of cases that are referred to court supervision and other methods to make safety plans and family service referrals mandatory, not voluntary. Report back on appropriate levels of training as well as types of training for county council who are reviewing DFCS cases and the level of training currently averaging among county council staff. Options to adopt improved reporting systems or other methods to support information sharing between parallel investigations to ensure that updated safety information for public safety units are accessible to DFCS social workers. And let me just translate that. Just means for us to have us for us, DFCS or the county, to have a shared mechanism with our local sheriff or uh, San Jose Police Department or any other municipality. Five, report back with a comprehensive evaluation of families refer referred to the Voluntary Family Maintenance Program to determine the effectiveness of the program in engaging families, including how VFEM referrals and participation impact hotline reports of the same family. Provide the board with options on next steps for a robust campaign to increase awareness of child abuse and neglect center and reporting number. And seven, provide the board with information and or options for a program to provide legal representation for all children with DFCS cases. Can I get a second? I'm seconding it, thank you. So this is for our colleagues as well as for um, our audience. Um, I hope the review wasn't too long, but I think it really is comprehensive. And if there is anything that we might have left out, we'd love to hear it now. Um, I'd also love to get the guidance of the president um, in terms of when we are able to ask questions. Absolutely now. Um, it was, oh. I appreciate that you, that you set up the motion first. That perhaps will enrich the conversation, but you're welcome to uh, begin with questions now. You're, you're at about six and a half minutes, and then we'll, it's fine, we'll come back. <laughs> Still, you can have all the I'm time gonna, you want. I'm going to speak really quickly. Okay. So at the beginning of the presentation, this is going to go to DFCS. I'm just going to go in the order of the presentations. You said that we should keep one thing in mind, and um, it was to keep kids in their homes, and that was as, as pinnacle, and I expected it to be one thing that we need to keep in mind, um, that we must be keeping kids safe, or at least two things in mind to keep them safe, and then ideally with their families. Um, what do you think it communicates to staff when you say one thing to keep in mind, and it's not related to safety? Thank you, for the, thank you for the question, Supervisor Arenas. Um, in regards to uh, our approach and how we're looking at child welfare, uh, the first thing is safety is paramount. Uh, definitely looking at opportunities when we engage families to make sure if there are opportunities for children to remain in the home safely, uh, that is our first option. If that child cannot remain in the home safely, uh, the child should be removed. Okay, thank you. Um, you did repeat that concept quite a number of times throughout um, your your comments, and so I'm going to move on to uh, James and ask him, is this the same concept and framework that you um, want to uphold as county exec? If I understand the, quest the question, um, safety has to be first, and we have, to t we have to take as a county the appropriate level of intervention to assure safety. In some cases, that is removal. In other cases, that's other options. But safety has to be first, and the intervention that's necessary has to be calibrated to that. Okay, then we have to calibrate that with the comments that are being um, released and mentioned throughout um, our meeting and they're coming from DFCS because what I heard loud and clear was that families need to stay together and you ended with an um, example of your own grandchild and how important it was for folks to surround um, her or him. I, I apologize, I forgot. And it made, it saddened me to think that 
Phoenix is not going to be, she's never going to reach that stage where she's walking because she stayed with her family, because she didn't have those services. And so I think we really need to make it clear that, we, that safety is first. Um, and I don't mean to um, uh, advance or want to uh, encourage removal. I want to encourage support for our parents and for those who are in, in voluntary or involuntary placements. Because I think I heard loud and clear from folks who came in is that if they had the resources and the services, they would have um, had different outcomes. And so I want that to be very clear. Um, the other question I had, um, and this is around decision making because uh, there was something in your um, report that said decision making should be in alignment with a dependency legal threshold. Um, and I'm wondering how many times GFCS has taken a different opinion um, regarding removal than county council and how many times have you cited with staff? Thank you, Supervisor, for that, that question. Um, today, I wouldn't have information to give you specific numbers. I do know there have been times when there have been discussions and um, the advice is not the same as what the staff were presenting. So I know that that absolutely has happened. Um, if, if that's something I can go back and try to get some additional data, that's something I could bring back. I appreciate it because I think it, County Council tracks this with, with a dashboard in that um, uh, and I wonder what else is being tracked there. And, uh, and so anyways, I'm, I'm hoping that there's some kind of response to this. Um, I, what I was really surprised with and in including your um, presentation is that there wasn't any data on there. One, it was released yesterday, last night, and to the public today. And so this is a 17-page report that all of this audience that came in today could have had read with, with some time if they had, um, if you had submitted it early. And I was really surprised that not even the Berkeley data that is ready to go was in it. What's the reason for the lack of, of data? Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. I think the intent was to provide a more of a general overview of the child welfare system at the, at the main decision points. Um, I think there, there are opportunities for sure for us to provide additional data, um, especially anything that would be interesting to the board um, that's going to help either answer questions or clarify either what had happened in the past or what's happening moving forward. Okay, I'm going to continue with the data because in the report it also indicates that the reduction of entries is being accomplished in a way where children's safety is still paramount. And so you, you, you adhere, you continue to adhere to that. And this is based on a reference to a statistic that is called 4-S2 um, recurrence of maltreatment. And this is available on the Berkeley website. But this data only tracks substantiated abuse, which means if our department starts substantiating less abuse overall, the data on substantiated reoccurrences will also drop, regardless of, of you know, if our policies are working or not. Correct? Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. And it, it is a nuanced um, outcome. I think the substantiation shows that our, when our social worker was in the home, they could, they could show that that abuse or neglect that was alleged occurred. So that's the homes that you would likely to see kind of more of the safety issues present. Um, so you're, you're right, the, the data has gone down, and it, and it does include both in-home as well as out-of-home children in that, in that uh, measure. So there were decisions to... Um Gosh darn it, I'm seeing my green light. Um, really what I'm, I'm hoping to, to see, to learn is with baby uh, Phoenix, she had three reports to the CAN Center and I realize her last report is of her death, but would she show up or her, uh, that specific statistic show up in the recurrence of maltreatment data? Yes, because there would be multiple substantiations. Those are substantiated. So if there were substantiated 
didn't that require a removal at some point or consideration for removal? So to your point, Supervisor Arenas, there's two parts to that. One is a child can have a substantiated referral and there's multiple parents. Uh, so in that particular situation, there was allegations on both parents. Um, in one circumstance, that particular parent uh, did not have a substantiation. In the other circumstance, that parent did. It would show up for that child uh, in regards to our assessment. Uh, again, the individual assessment of the social worker and our team at the department is really looking at can that child stay safely in the home. I want to direct you to research attachment um, for, for infants, and this is something that I had to do quite a bit. My undergrad is in human development, early childhood. Also, I had my son very early, and he stayed in the hospital for two and a half months, and so I worried about the type of attachment that I would have because he wasn't with me 24 hours. It was a forced separation. Now, I know that parents who have substance abuse uh, issues sometimes have some dysregulation in themselves and mirror that with their babies. And so it, that creates uh, avoidant or um, unstable attachments. And that is just as important as the kind of attachment that is impacted when you remove a child. So the trauma either happens at an infant stage or it happens a little bit later when you actually remove that child. The, there's trauma happening either way because when a child stays in a home, that's also trauma bonding. And a child is learning that this kind of damage, this kind of hurt is okay from the people that should care for them the most. So we need to look at all the data and not just the data that I have heard you cite over and over that traumatizes children from removal. And I'm not negating that data. I'm sure that it's there. But there's also on the other side the data of attachment, which is clearly just as important. Thank you. Supervisor. So I'll include that in, in my motion, but I know I need to move on. Not a problem. We will, we will come back. Let me look to Supervisor Simidian for any additional comments or questions. Thank you, uh, Madam President, colleagues. Um, <clears throat> Two distinct but obviously interconnected uh, issues. One is what happened in the case of Baby Phoenix, and the other is sort of where do we go from here, which the motion speaks to. Uh, I did want to pull out a little bit uh, of information about <clears throat> what we know and what we're allowed to know and what we can share and what we can't. Uh, in looking at the staff report, um, we are reminded that social services, county social services, uh, requested an independent external review uh, by the, uh, of the department's work in the case from the California Department of Social Services. Yes? That's correct, Supervisor. Thanks. And that on December the 4th, the California Department of Social Services sent us their completed review with respect to this specific case, or actually sent their completed review to the department, to our county department of um, family and children's services. Yes? Yes. But, uh, and I'm not uh, criticizing, I'm just trying to make sure I've got the process straight here both for our board and for the public, but our board is not allowed to see that study, or excuse me, that, that report. Is that correct? That is accurate, Supervisor, per the, per the state. And the state has told us that because it contains confidential information, our board of supervisors is precluded from seeing the report. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, you may or may not know uh, that I'm the privacy guy on our board, if I may stake out that title, uh, that, um, that 
that being said, uh, I think there are understandable concerns about both transparency and accountability if the Board of Supervisors that has the responsibility for hiring and evaluating the board appointed officers, including the county executive, and the county executive is, of course, responsible for uh, the administration of most of the county. Um, th thoughts, and if you want to have me turn to Mr. Williams, I will, but thoughts about how we can respect confidentiality and privacy while still ensuring some greater degree of transparency and candidly responsibility for, um, please, uh, responsibility for assessing, I mean, you can't figure out how to make it right if you don't know what went wrong, simply put. And, and, and that's not about blame and shame, that's about you can't make it right if you don't know what wrong. Um, so I'm just sitting here trying to figure out how do we as a board follow up on the, 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 the motion, do our job, quite bluntly, um, Mr. Williams, I see you leaning in in a red light on, so if I may, through the chair, I'll uh, see if there's some way to thread the needle here. Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. I, uh, first, I'll just share that um, I think it's um, disappointing that the direction that came explicitly from the state uh, was that the report, because it contains uh, Welfare and Institutions Code 827 data, cannot be shared outside the department. Uh, so the board hasn't gotten a copy to be clear i haven't either um, and i think that is uh, problematic because um, it for the reasons that you just stated uh, i know that the department asked the state for clarification and the state responded uh, affirming that direction i think it would make sense for us to once again more formally request that the state um, either rescind that direction or produce an alternate document that the state feels comfortable sharing. Um, if there's, you know, if they can redact or segregate, I don't know, but however they see fit to do so, because I completely agree. I think it is um, unhelpful, candidly, for the state to have produced a document and then directed that it's fully confidential and can't be shared elsewhere in the organization, including the county executive or the board. Thank you. And um, you, you anticipated my next question, which was, could we request a redacted version of the document? I am mindful of the request I made, which this board supported 5-0, uh, to have a redacted uh, document from our own county council's office in connection with uh, a multi-million dollar claim and an individual who was in our county jail. And we, we managed with help from county council to be transparent about what was happening, what had happened and it still protect the privacy uh, of the individuals involved as appropriate. So I would, I would, uh, I guess I would ask the maker of the motion and the seconder if that's something that you would incorporate in, in the, the motion. Can you repeat? Yeah, basically to direct staff to ask the state for a redacted version of the report so that we get, that respects privacy and confidentiality, but that still lets us read the rest of the report. Oh, for Baby Phoenix. For Baby Phoenix, just that case. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And um, part of the reason I ask, not the only reason, but part of the reason I ask is, looking at page six of 17 in the staff report, uh, the language jumped out at me in a long report. Uh, CDSS, California Department of Social Services report, does not include any required actions, recommendations, or findings which are within CDSS's authority should it have deemed them appropriate. So again, trying to exercise our responsibility, hold ourselves accountable to make the system a better one. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little tough to read that uh, the state took a look and uh, provided nothing in the way of recommendations or findings or required actions. And um, there may be some rationale for that, but I think it's helpful and important to know what the rationale is. So that's the reason for my request. So I say thank you to the maker and the seconder if the seconder is comfortable with all that. Yes. Thank you. Then, um, Supervisor Chavez, I can, see your, uh, I can see your face here on my screen. Uh, get better, feel better. Um, I was listening to the conversation about the CAN Center. This is the Child Abuse and Neglect Call Center uh, 
I believe that you and I spent many a meeting on over many, many months um, when we had a really unacceptable level of call uh, pickup and we hung in uh, there till, as I recall, we got to a 98, 99% pickup rate. Am I remembering this right? If I may, through the chair to Supervisor Chavez, my colleague. Yeah, it was in, it was about in the 93 to 94 where a live pickup and then a return call relatively quickly. But Thank yes, you. that's exactly what we worked on. That's what I was. That's where I was getting the 99% number for for the quick return call added to. Thank you. And I I think when we started and this came to your attention, my attention about the same time, but independently, if I'm remembering that part correctly, uh, I think when we started it was literally in the high 50%. It's like 59 or so. Yeah. So um, colleagues. I guess there was some mention of the center tonight and turning to staff, uh, what are we looking at in terms of performance these days because, uh, uh, because um, if that's the starting place in the system, having the call center function efficiently and effectively is a necessary precondition to the system working. Okay. Thank you for the question, uh, Supervisor Samidian. We're actually above the 94% in regards to answer call rate currently. Okay. Um, Supervisor Arenas and Supervisor Chavez, forgive me if I missed it in the motion, but if we could get that information formally as part of the report back uh, with direction from uh, the motion, I, I think it's helpful and important. Can you, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to figure out how to organize this because clearly you have useful information, but we can't do um, a back and forth. So who can advise me? I think if you're asking a question of a specific person, they can come up and engage. It's the chair's prerogative. Cool. If you have a specific answer. <laughs> to the question and the supervisor who asked the question would like a direct answer, come on up. I, I don't want to start a back and forth respectfully. So Sorry. Here, I think the way I'd like to structure it is, I would like to, if the maker and the seconder are amenable, to incorporate a direct instruction to staff to, when they come back in February, as I understand it, to provide that information. And Madam President, I, I think this might be the best way to do it. Uh, after consultation with line staff about how the process works and to explicitly call out who is um, able to take those calls, which is the, I think, the intent of the comment that's coming from the rear of the chambers. Could we, uh, is that amenable to the maker and the yes. seconder? Yes, actually, I was thinking Thank about you. that. Thank and you. And then. If I could, on that, um, Supervisor Samidian, um, through the chair, I, I think that report on the CAN Center numbers um, is important. I think the second element to that that was raised was the um, connection to the investigative process and how quickly those were being able to be respond to, responded to relative to a staffing issue. So I do want to just ask the staff to be, to be broad in their interpretation, not just the numbers, but of also the function and any, any concerns about that function. Happy to incorporate that explicitly with the consent of the maker and the seconder. Yes. Got it. Thank you, uh, Supervisor. And then my, my last uh, question for the moment at least is um, the SDM, the Structured Decision Making Tool, my understanding is that our county, like other counties, is, quote, required by state law to use that tool. Is that correct? That is correct. So my question, and I'm, I'm dead on serious about this is, what do you think about that? Because what I don't know since I don't use the tool and what I'm trying to discern here is, is that a tool in your judgment and experience that brings some rigor and, and discipline to the way decisions are made? Or is it a tool that sort of puts things on autopilot in a way that's not helpful? I honestly don't know and that's why I'm asking you. And I don't. So thank you for the question, Supervisor Samidian. The way I would respond is uh, the tool is actually part of what's called safety organized practice. So the tool is one piece. Uh, the other piece to that is our social workers clinical assessment. 
that has to be added to the completion of the tool. So as they're completing the tool, they're utilizing their own clinical assessment to basically walk through that particular tool to make decisions. The other piece to that is also how are we engaging a particular family. So all of those things rolled together actually come into what's called safety organized practice. So the tool isn't standalone is what I'm trying to say. Got it. Yeah. Um, would anyone else like to add their own judgment or assessment? No, okay. Um, I think for the moment those are the uh, the issues I have. Uh, this will come back at our February meeting if the motion is approved, is that correct? correct? Okay. And staff will address then by providing the options that are requested in the motion more more specific detail and perhaps some options according to the motion. Yes, uh, let me just look to Mr. Williams for confirmation on that. Yes. Okay, just want to keep the timeline through. Thank you, thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, and Supervisor. And thank you to everyone who spoke. Apologies, thank you, Supervisor Lee. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Madam President, I'll have a few questions for staff first. Um, first of all, the, uh, the motion has encompassed quite a few parts and this is requested to come back on February 6th, which is basically six weeks from now. Uh, just want to make sure the administration, will you be able to uh, come back with these recommendations or do you think there might be things that you might need to push back? I just want to make sure it's realistic and that we're prioritizing what's, what we could get back because obviously it's very urgent, but I want to make sure that the workload is actually doable and not mission possible here. We will bring back uh, every piece that we can expeditiously, and if there are specific items, um, especially some of the data requests that, that might take more time, we will note that in the report back. Uh, but we you know, don't know quite yet um, what that might look like, but we'll bring back every piece that we can on that timeline. Okay, thank you. And then the second thing I want to ask is regarding the similar to SDM analysis that we talked about regarding um, the latest uh, issue with this deadly drug fentanyl. Should there be a change of the SDM analysis because of this drug that is now changing the equation of how we should deal with these issues? Yes, yeah, Supervisor, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I think that there's two separate components. I think there's the actual SDM tool. Um, which doesn't include any specific substance, but does include substance impacted or substance exposed. Um, I think that there's also the practice question of what we do with that information. And I think some of the interim direction you saw from uh, Director Wright is around that. It's around the, the present um, crisis facing families and, and how we can potentially respond in a different manner based on that. So I think it's both of that. I also think that there is an opportunity at the state level as we see fentanyl as something going across the state, that, that we can have some policy discussions with the state, specifically around the use of these tools um, and how we're factoring in these, these more, more, more aggressive issues. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have some closing comments, uh, President. Should I make it now or should I make it when it comes back in the second round? Your choice. Okay, I, I think I could save it to the second round. Let everybody ask all the questions first. Thank okay. you. Great, thank you. Um, I will participate in this in this round as well. I have a couple of general questions uh, for staff first, um, and then some some comments about the motion, which I very much look forward to supporting uh, today. Um, the first question is: Dr. Sturm still here? Hi. Um, my, my my question um, is is in a response to the information. Um, that you shared, and I'm interested to know to the extent um, administration is aware of the barriers that she highlighted um, for the CAC clients um, who are being uh, who are being examined and the older kids who are being sent somewhere else for an examination. It sounds like that's counter to the purpose of the CAC. Thank you. I, um, Dr. Sturm can speak to this, obviously, in, in more detail, but I will say that um, as soon as this came on, on my radar, um, we asked that Casey Halcon and Paul Lorenz mm -hmm. work with Dr. Sturm and others to quickly get to the heart of what was the 
the reason that patients aren't being seen at the CAC and we're instead being seen in hospital settings, and I know they're working to get to the heart of this issue and get it resolved. Great. So I would like to ask, I don't need to make it part of the, the most, well, could we get an off agenda, not necessarily on the same timing with, with your report? Is that included in the report? I actually have yeah. an addition to that. Would you like cool. to hear it? I'm happy to, to wait for that, but if you're going okay. to address it, I will just put a, a pin in it. So thank you. Um, Do you require the, an answer to your question? Oh, you're there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, Dr. Sturm. Um, I am delighted to hear your, your thoughts, but I did get the, so the answer I was looking for. So we have been requesting yes. that um, the adult SART team see children at the CAC since we opened two and a half years ago. We have been objecting strenuously to their lack of participation at the CAC for the last 20 months okay. um, with no progress, including monthly meetings with the quality supervisor. Um, it is a political quagmire, um, which in part has to do with the extraordinary work the adult SART team has done in our county. We have extraordinary respect for what they have done in our county, but I must say that the adult SART team leadership are not pediatricians. They're not child abuse pediatricians, and they do not engage with the Department of Pediatrics. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your, your sun shining this issue. I, it sounds like some members of our administration are on it. I am very interested in helping to remedy that. So thank you again, with, and thank you to Greta. With tremendous respect for our colleagues. I hear that, thank you. Um, Dan, I think this is probably uh, for you or maybe Damien. We, we heard a lot about the structured decision-making tool. Um, and I'm, I'm interested if you could just say a little bit about the process on how the department decided to choose evident change and who, who validates that, that tool to ensure that the questions don't have any kind of implicit bias. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg. Evident Change is actually the, the organization, although they've changed name, that created structured decision making. So they're the only ones with the license to be able to provide the training. They actually have the contract with the state of California uh, to provide the, the assistance guidance for the state. And their research, which is something that we could share also, um, the research that's gone into structured decision making over the years, I think as it was noted in the report, I um, mean, we're going on a couple decades of California utilization, so I, there should be significant amount of data we can share. Thanks, and I'll, I'll just share one one example again, um, coming from a, a perspective of learning this. One one of the questions adds a point to the risk and safety assessment tools if one or more of the parents of the former foster it was one of the parents was a former foster youth, and. My impression is that I, I think that that could potentially perpetuate an intergenerational cycle of trauma if, if that already puts a child at higher risk. Yeah, and that's a great, great question, uh, Supervisor. And the SDM risk tool is actually the one that's an actuarial, so it's, it's the, the same across the nation. So we should be able to find specific data on how they built that tool out. Oh, interesting. So whether it's good or not, biased or not, it's the only one we've got. Great. <laughs> uh, the one thing I would add, Supervisor, just to be clear, is re it's yes, required by all Calif uh, California uh, counties. Got it. So we, we don't have the flexibility to amend or modify we do not. that tool. Um, I'm going to switch to um, a substance abuse uh, question. We, we, of course, have the county has a contract uh, with a residential treatment facility for pregnant and parenting mothers to be housed with their, their children. Um, do we know what the utilization of Parisi House on the Hill um, is? Is that full all the time? Thank you for the question, Supervisor Ellenberg. Uh, the utilization is not 100%. Uh, it's more in mid-range in regards to the slots that we have and the utilization of those slots. So it concerns me if a mother who is 
willing at that moment to go into treatment and has a, for example, three-month-old, two-month-old infant, is told there's not an available spot. What does that mean when technically Parisi does have spaces? I mean, Supervisor, that is something that we would want to look at because specifically for DFCS, we mm -hmm. have um, separate funding that we're doing just for the beds for, for clients that we're serving. So um, I think that is something that definitely we would need to look into. And, and, and please do and include that in the report back because it's just incongruous to me to think that we would tell a mother that there's nothing available when, when we literally have something available. Uh, thank you. Um, the um, the makers of the, the of the motion requested that um, administration exempt some DFCS positions uh, from the hiring um, the hiring freeze. Are any of those positions already on the list of exemptions uh, that we received at, at FGOC? And does administration have that information available? There are two types of exemption processes for the hiring freeze. Mm -hmm. One are uh, blanket exemptions for certain uh, department-specific classifications where there's no general fund impact. Uh, and the other is, are it is an exemption process for individual positions brought forward by departments reviewed weekly. Mm -hmm. um, so the social worker positions, which are cross-departmental classifications and also are positions that are um, that include some general fund are not on the categorical exemption list right now, um, but they are positions like all others that can be brought forward right now on a position by position basis for exemption. That's the current status. Okay, thank you. So I, I am supporting the motion's uh, direction, but we, we heard earlier today um, uh, specifically from SEMA and, and SEIU that they're united in asking for uh, all related positions in DFCS to be part of the exemption list. I would, um, I would support that and, and ask the maker um, and seconder of the motion if, if they'll agree to include that group as well. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thanks. I have a couple of questions. Um, about the about the memo, and thank you so much uh, to both Supervisor Arenas and and Chavez for offering this really comprehensive um, and well thought out uh, direction. Um, to to be clear, I am going to um, I am going to support it. On um, recommendation A one, I fully appreciate and support a statement making clear that there will not be retaliation, of course, against anyone for raising concerns about the system. Don't get into my question time, please. Um, <laughs> separately, um, I want to ensure that county staff and community partners are set up for success in raising their concerns, because of, of course, obviously, the, everyone is required to respect clients' privacy rights and the laws that preserve confidentiality of, of juvenile records. So I, I would just like to see that statement called for in A1 make clear that county personnel making complaints about systems or processes should, of course, not include protected confidential information unless it's legal to do so, and then to clearly identify where county personnel can make complaints that include um, confidential information if that's necessary. Is that acceptable? Yes, ma'am. Awesome, thank you. Um, on A3, um, just have a concern here, and I'm. Um, I, I would either like to hold it separately, or or just make clear that we're asking for options to come back. Because my, my concern and um, an interest maybe in holding off voting on A three, and, and instead perhaps asking uh, County Council for an off agenda, because I'm I'm concerned that there might be some legal. Uh, ramifications here of what we can actually do. So if it's just coming back with options, I'm happy for them, I'm happy to include it in the motion and they can come back and say, yes, you can do this, no, you can't. Um, but if it's, if it's affirmative direction, then I would rather pull it and ask for a report back first and then of course, happy to vote on it later if it's permitted. 
What uh, I, what, I'm sorry, what item was it? A3. And Supervisor Chavez, do you want to address that? I see your hands up. I'm happy to, or I, I would, could wait after uh, Supervisor Adonis. I have so many papers in front of me. I'm trying to find my <laughs> referral again. You want me to come back? <laughs> no, I've no, got a no. Few I, I know I have it here because um, I was reading from it. Oh, here it is. Okay, so it, what num what A3. item A3, A3 report A3. to the board? Mm, oh, okay, position, including positions to hire executive staff. Um, I just don't know that we can legally get involved with that, and if we can, I'm happy to have it come back and, and vote on it separately. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to have a uh, county council look into it and see what that is, but I think, it, but I, we can change it to a commitment. Um, but I'm happy to work with county council to figure that piece out. Okay, so then. May, may I'll, I make I'll a recommendation? From... Yeah, my recommendation would be that the staff come back for options um, for addressing this issue because I think what uh, Supervisor Adonis and I are interested in is really looking at um, the, 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 how we're staffing those levels. So if the staff could come back with options, I think that, that's better, it's better to do it concurrently than consecutively. Um, but I'd be really interested in their thoughts about what the options are for uh, the board to better understand the staffing models and the leadership of the department. That, that works for me to have it come back um, concurrently. Again, I know as supervisors, we have four appointees. We're not engaged in, in other hiring decisions, so I just want information on that before we commit to anything. Thank you so much. Um, uh, item C1 um, notes uh, additional special meetings, and, and I just want to say really as the, with the prerogative of the board president here, is that certainly the report back on today's motion should come to the full board during a, a board of supervisors meeting just the way we, signif we sunshine other significant organizational actions through um, reports to the whole board, like the quarterly updates on the mental health and substance use disorder crisis and the jail study sessions, um, just to name a couple of examples. If you're thinking about really deeper work um, that would require standalone meetings, I would encourage you to take that back to the committee structure, which shouldn't be a barrier after today's comprehensive referral is approved because the board direction is clear. Because Supervisor Chavez and myself are brown acted and we are in committee together, we can't discuss this at committee. It has to be at full board. We approve and not, not, just, oh, I th my understanding is that that's only true before the board has approved action. But if the board approves this today, you can talk about all of this in committee. If I may, President Ellenberg. Please do. So the action of the board at the last meeting was to uh, temporarily remove DFCS matters from the CSFC uh, committee f uh, through, um, uh, through the year. Uh, and I believe um, uh, into the beginning of January 2025. And so uh, it, wouldn't, it, it couldn't go back to the committee uh, during that time period. And I would then just I'm add one thing, um, Super, uh, President Ellenberg, and that is that one thing that is um, a little unique about this process is that in those other instances that you described, even behavioral health, we had a number of deep, um, big meetings like the Blue Ribbon Task Force and then the Reentry Center taking a look at behavioral health. So in order to not violate the Brown Act and frankly to keep this on our, our um, in the line of sight of the entire board, um, I think, I mean, what I'd be interested in is getting your feedback working through staff on the very best ways to bring these meaty issues back. I think we want them in front of the whole board for the next year and I, I, I personally think it's, I, and I know everybody thinks it's important, um, but I think one of the challenges is that there's no other way to do a really significant deep dive, especially in the areas that are most challenging. So I'm, I will absolutely live with that. I will tell you that I, my inclination will be to include them on regular board meeting um, agendas. And if we so, can time, time certain them, that might be helpful. We can absolutely time certain them. Um, Thank you. On items D1, 2, and 4, I don't have any um, changes to recommend, but want to um, just add some 
questions or some comments that I'd like administration to take into account when returning to the board uh, with options. The first one for D1, um, that's a request for options for administration uh, for an independent uh, entity or authority for whistleblowing. I, I know that CDSS exists for this purpose, and we have the Juvenile Welfare Office of Ombuds, which mediates between the family and DFCS staff. We have our own whistleblower program. I just want to make sure that if we are doing something additional, that it's not um, redundant and, and how that would work with what we already have. And if it's, and if an additional piece um, is, is necessary. So again, just to include that in the analysis. On D2, uh, that's a report back on policy options for the board to consider that would allow um, increased oversight of cases. That also feels like a legal question rather than policy, so I'll be interested in that. And then four, um, alternatives to incarceration really continues to be a policy priority for me. Um, and, and the Dependency Advocacy Center, a few of them spoke today, have also reported concerns with already excessive surveillance, surveillance for black and brown families. So any expansion there um, would be problematic for me. But again, interested in the, in the report coming back. So with all of that um, information, I, I want to again thank, thank my colleagues. I'm looking forward to seeing the report on February 6th and, and really seeing where, not just with those of us up here, but everyone here who has been here earlier, how we move forward together. Thank you. So we will go back to Supervisor Thank Chavez you. started this. So oh, Chavez, yes, then Arenas, and I'll be right back. Thank you, I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to defer. I'm actually taking a lot of notes so we get the motion right. <laughs> go ahead. Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, you know, one of, I have a couple of more things, but for this, because of the time, I will skip and just go to um, uh, the missing role of the Board of Supervisors in your report. Um, I was saddened to see that there wasn't really a place for us, even though earlier this year in January, we approved um, policy priorities that include enhancing the support for children and families. And so it's important for us to not work and operate in silos. This is something that I shared with you previously last week. Um, and I want to be part of the answers. Uh, it doesn't, um, my memo here or my direction isn't to just direct, but it's in response to a lot of the concerns that we've heard and the, um, our own uh, inquiries that we have made um, in hopes that we can provide some policy um, support for those folks who are stakeholders and of course keeping our children in mind and this, that's one of the things that we have in common. Um, but I don't see our role once again and so I, I'm not comfortable um, there's something I, I, I would like to daylight to my colleagues, and um, and the reason why maybe this is why this this report looks like this. Earlier this year, around March, I shared almost the same concerns that we have that we heard today um, with our the current uh, CEO, which was Jeff Smith, Dr. Smith. He asked me to speak to Dan Little. I did. Um, and it really it was, um, it was discouraging to hear because my concern was not to remove children um, from their homes. My concern was to keep children safe. And for whatever reason, it seems like maybe we're in different um, uh, sides of the coin there. Although we're, I think we, I believe we're saying the same thing. Um, I followed up and requested additional information, which I never received, short of asking for the report that the state had asked for. And by the way, in your report, you do reflect that um, part, of the, part of the report and part of the uh, investigation report, part of the inv investigation was because of some of the social workers that called into the California um, Social Services Department 
and not just the five-year plan that is typic that typically happens to all 58 counties. Um, but you didn't say that um, today. And we, DFCS was being investigated since last year because of social worker concerns. They took a risk and made those calls. That's what their report says. Yet we weren't told about this. It, and I specifically asked, like, short of saying, like, give me that report that I don't know anything about and I have, I have no idea that this investigation is going on, I asked our county exec, I asked the director, I later then connected with our current county exec, and everybody withheld that report. They could have given me the, the information at that time, but really it was this withholding of information and lack of trust in um, our collective leadership. I don't understand it, and I've asked this question in private, and I haven't gotten a, a real answer from all of you in terms of why didn't you share this report with the Board of Supervisors? Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. And I first want to say that, that we absolutely see you as a partner. And, um, you know, in my, in my work on the um, Children Master Plan that I saw you when you were at the city, you know, impressed by your, your dedication and passion for serving our, our, the children and youth in our community. So um, I, I do see that we, have, um, that, we're, that we have a lot that we can do together and I definitely want to include you in the planning. Um, regarding the report from the state, you know, I, I, that is something that I, going back, I wish we would have shared. I wish that I would have had that information to share with you and um, we would have been able to have that discussion. I think um, in, in that moment, we were looking at that report, initial report from the state as requesting more information from us to answer some of their questions. So we were, we were actively working on a response back. But to your point, um, yeah, I wish I would have lifted that up and shared it with the entire board so we could have had that discussion back then. Well, you, you all did have a response to the state that our county exec reviewed, and you still didn't share with the Board of Supervisors. That's correct. We were, I think we were waiting for a response back from the state after we'd answered their questions. Um, so that was, the, that was the reason. But again, we should have shared when we originally received that, so we could have had those dialogues many, many months ago. I think you can understand why I'm interacting the way that I'm interacting, when there isn't trust. Because I can feel what this is, and this is a lack of trust. Unfortunately for me, it's a breach of trust. And when, when a department head, along with uh, a director, does not provide that information, that, that lack of transparency, it, it makes me think about, and colleagues help me figure this piece out, should we receive reports when there's investigations happening to our departments? I don't know. It, do you all care for these reports? Because I, I do. I would like to be informed of what these reports have to say. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm really disappointed with, with the report that you had um, you submitted. Um, it was tone deaf. I shared with you my concerns. Haven't addressed my concerns. Um, and because of that, I'm going to ask for some structural changes in order to improve the oversight of DFCS. So I'd like to make a motion, uh, um, add to the motion, which is to direct administration to report back at the February meeting with a structural change to improve oversight of the Department of Children and Family Services, including A, removing DFCS from social services aging agency and directing their director to report directly to the county exec's office, B, appoint a deputy county executive with a background in child welfare to directly oversee DFCS for county executive, C, direct that deputy to present to the board in February, Two direct the administration to develop a work plan from the direction provided and present on that work plan at the February meeting. And I think this answers or addresses some of the some of what you were talking about, Supervisor Simidian, about like what are the next steps. Well, part of those next steps, I think, is formulating a work plan and not 
putting this all in front of you know our department, but making some sense out of it. And so I think a work plan um, could address that. Three, it's direct administration to add all legislative files related to DFCS system improvements and any information that reflects data around removals and fatalities in the pipeline report to the full board under the regular agenda. Ensure no future related reports be placed under the consent calendar. Four, direct administration to re report back to the full board in detail how the CEO and board of supervisors will be incorporated into the children of color working group discussions that are underway. And last thing, this has to do with the, the SART um, issue that we heard uh, Dr. Sturm talk about earlier, and that is report back on the plan to finalize the updated sexual assault response team protocol, including recommendations for how to expand coverage for adolescents at the CAC with a three to six min, uh, month window for completion. Um, because children should be seen at the Children's Advocacy Center and not at a sterile hospital. Okay. <clears throat> we have a motion. Um, first of all, do we have a second? Well, we have a motion and a second on the on the floor on already. The floor, right? So, uh, and Sylvia, I'm so sorry I missed the under the the DFCS report. The DFCS direct piece. Yes, it it is to direct it uh, to. Di to direct the director to report directly to the county exec's office. So basically pull out DFCS from social services so that we can have a more um, direct oversight with the county exec, appoint a um, deputy county exec that has that kind of background in child welfare, um, and ask that deputy to present to the board in February. And that one I'm a little open to. It doesn't have to be in February. but. Uh, maybe bring some options in February. So can, um, if we could ask, um, so first of all, I think um, restructuring DFCS is a really good idea um, and, and, had, and had been thinking about that as well. What I'd like to do, just because we just had a conversation with our employees about engaging them, what I'd like to recommend is that we engage our employees in this um, structural change discussion and have that report come to the board with some, some uh, a little more color around what you're requesting. I think the timeline may be a little challenging in terms of hiring the right person, but I would like to make sure we talk to the employee groups before we make that kind of change. Through the chair? Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, at some point, I would like to hear what the county executive thinks about this, but to the maker and the seconder, um, at, Piggybacking on what uh, Supervisor Chavez just said, I do think um, because this is emerging at this meeting, I, I'm not prepared right this moment, at, right at this time, to sort of make a judgment about if and how uh, the department is restructured. I am certainly open to that, and the original motion uses the language refer to administration to report with information and options for consideration. And is that still your intent on this last part? We, we certainly can revert to the, I, I'm open to that. Well, I, sure. I think that would, that would bring me along because I think it's sure. an important discussion to have. Listen, and I, I, absolutely, I, I'm not trying, this is my solution to this. Um, and I, I've tried, I've really tried. And so when, when others are not participating with me, then I'm just going to have to, ask for some options, and I'm, I'm happy to, to bring it back in the way of, of having them review and consider and have options for, for us. And, and then the other part of it that Supervisor Chavez referenced was the timeline. Might I respectfully suggest that this particular piece be um, before the end of the fiscal year, meaning June, uh, so that it doesn't hold up the rest of the work that uh, is in your original main motion. I don't know if that works for you or not, but I'm just. Um, what, why don't they bring us back? You are asking for them to bring back some options in by June. As a sort of a separate but obviously related component, yes. Um, can we m meet in the middle and and do March because um, 
I'm afraid that once um, the budget begins, which is in March, it, that time will be lost to the budget anyways. Sure, I, I'm happy. I, I would uh, appreciate that uh, direction in part because, and this is born out of some painful experience I've had over the years, I don't want to let the new language and ref direction be the basis for anyone saying we didn't have enough time to bring you the first part by February, if, you, if, you, if my sure. point is clear. So thank you with that, that understanding. And um, through the vice chair, if I may, uh, could we hear from the county executive uh, on this before? Could. Administration isn't prepared to um, opine on the suggestion at this time. We will need to look at a whole number of factors, including the fiscal interrelationships associated with the social services agency, uh, which is heavily dependent on state funding as well as a number of things. I don't know what realistic time frame there is, but we will, consistent with the board's direction, look at those options and come back with information for the board uh, associated with the restructuring, but um, it is uh, not a straightforward item. That much I can tell you now. Okay. Um, thank you, Supervisor comments? Arenas. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Okay, uh, Supervisor Arenas, anything else? No. Okay, no, good. that's it. All right, sure. Um, and I just want to go ahead and make my, uh, uh, like I said earlier, there's uh, my closing comments on this one. Um, I, I really was shocked when I saw that pick up my, uh, uh, my Sunday paper uh, and read about the article and really felt the pain for the tragic loss of Baby Phoenix uh, two months ago. And we certainly cannot and will not accept this kind of loss, especially under our county's watch. There are no easy solutions in these situations, and we need to better understand each of these individual cases on removal in order to not make such mistakes again. We definitely need additional resources. Staffing, staffing from clinicians to social workers as the FCS to handle these increased caseloads and to do better work, more comprehensive case background analysis. Otherwise, this is not sustainable. Burned out workers can't help others when they are too stressed out themselves. We should include our case workers in these decision making to hear directly from the county councils and to make sure that these decisions are made jointly and understood by all the stakeholders. And at the same time, we also must not overreact to this one tragedy and push for premature removals when keeping the child with alternative family arrangements are still available. The damage of unnecessary removal is not only costly to the county, but extremely traumatic to the child and family as well. We need early intervention and prevention efforts well before removal, and the resources to help the parents and families must be culturally appropriate in language so the family and the child would actually understand what the heck is going on. If it's on English and the family don't speak or understand English, that is not services. It's a recipe for failure. We need these services not only for kids five and under, but also older children as well. This special hearing is a reminder that we must continue to combat drug addiction, especially fentanyl, which is killing thousands of Americans, adults and children every single day. And therefore, we must also make easy access to the substance abuse treatment programs to be one of the highest priority in these intervention efforts. What is medical detox? What is social detox? Making detox programs readily available to both adults and children must be a high priority in order for us to put a dent in these problems we are seeing today. In memory of Baby Phoenix, including her granduncle, let's work hard together to make sure that Something good will come out of this. So now we have a motion on the floor. Uh, and I just want to see if there's any more comments and questions. Nope. Okay. I, I know Supervisor um, um, <clears throat> uh, 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 President Ellenberg just stepped out. I certainly think this is an important vote, but I'm, I'm sure she would like to take take the vote on this one. So I'm just going to wait till she comes back to uh, call for the vote. If there's no more comments, 
Thank you, and apologies. I've been listening, but I suddenly just developed an excruciating headache, which required some laying down, but I'm not going to miss this vote. OK. Yeah. Rhonda? Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Sumidian? Aye. Vice President Lee? Aye. President Ellenberg? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And with that, we are adjourned.